Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Fault lines. And we're back, coming to you live from across the divided states of America. It is Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan in the politically independent corner. I am an investigative political analyst and radio show host, Jane Stranahan. And in the left corner, I am the indefatigable, ever vigilant, a burning ember in the darkness, your political analyst, Jamal Thomas. Together, we are Fault Line with Thomas and Stranahan. And we're getting straight into it. First up, we have the headlines. We repeat those at 8 and 9 a.m. Eastern. After this first batch of headlines, we're going into Jamar's monologue. And right after that, we are taking calls. Your calls, specifically. You, not just you, though. 202-521-1320 is our number. Feel free to give us a call. We'll be around in about 15 minutes. But again, first, we've got these headlines. Straight into them. Two were killed and more were wounded in Kenosha, Wisconsin, after a shooting in Kenosha on Sunday night led to more protests. The man who was shot, Jacob Blake, is said to be in stable condition other than being paralyzed from the waist down, possibly for life, doctors say. Uh, again, though, last night, uh, two, two killed, one more wounded, back and forth, apparently between protesters and what seems to have been a militia that was organized to protect businesses. Um, uh, long guns were carried. Uh, again, people were shot. It's kind of a confusing situation. There's a bunch of video out there, uh, a lot of it pretty extreme. Um, but that is the situation last I checked in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, last night was also RNC night two, Republican National Convention night two. Eric Trump, Tiffany Trump, and Melania Trump all giving speeches. Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, also gave an address from Israel. Uh, Rep. Joaquin Castro, later the Texas Democrat Vice Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, later said he would investigate whether the address violates State Department policies in the Federal Hatch Act which prohibits federal officials from engaging in political activity in their official capacity. That, by the way, is the same Hatch Act that also may restrict Trump from giving a speech on the White House South Lawn. Um, at the event, angel mom Mary Ann Mendoza got pulled. She was an angel mom, um, mother, of a, mother of someone killed, um, got pulled from the RNC after spreading a QAnon post that incorporated anti-Semitic messaging. Uh, hurricane Laura may be a Category 3 hurricane as it makes landfall. After all, 600,000 are ordered to evacuate, and a storm surge, storm, storm surge warning is in place across much of Louisiana's coastline. Parts of eastern Houston are also in the crossfires of that hurricane, reportedly. Jerry Falwell Jr. is resigning from Liberty University, after all, taking home a $10.5 million payout. That's about two years of pay plus an $8 million bonus. Uh, this comes after accusations of an affair by former pool boy John Carlo Granda, who alleged an affair, a love, like six-year-long affair with Falwell Jr., his wife, uh, and and uh, John Carlo Granda, um, Jerry Falwell Jr., son of Jerry Falwell Sr., um, both Christian, both evangelists. So again, this is this is taking on that moral tone, uh, kind of undercutting themes of hypocrisy. Anyway, um, he has put he is he's pulled away. He's, there's a back and forth over whether or not he would actually resign from Liberty University. He has done so, taking home quite a bit of money. We'll see where he goes from there. Our next story, 54% of San Francisco's storefronts are no longer in business. Again, 54% of San Francisco's storefronts are no longer in business. Uh, 1,200 stores there are still open after about 1,300 have closed. City's unemployment numbers are also very high, with claims reaching 193,000. That is four times the number of claims filed in 2008 during the Great Recession. Over in New York City, on a sort of similar vein, uh, in a sort of similar vein, Mayor Bill de Blasio said that indoor dining may not return until after the arrival of a vaccine, uh, you know, next year at some point. That leaves a lot of restaurants in this sort of existential chasm um, where, you know, they, they need money, and they, they really are not making enough money, and they need they need to, to reopen indoor dining in order to stay alive. And if they don't do that, they're going to die. And uh, that, that leaves a lot of us, and a lot of them, wondering what the heck they're going to do, how that's going to change American society, how that's going to affect our economy, all these different sides. Anyway, on the other coast, that was in New York City, over in California, its fires are now affecting air quality as far away as parts of Colorado and Kansas. 
having drifted towards the center of the continental United States. Um, redwoods, by the way, I'm just going to throw this in. Uh, redwood forests are uh, resistant to fire. And so there are these there are these videos of the redwoods, you know, these like beautiful, majestic red trees, like in this completely denuded, ashy landscape where the redwoods are still standing. And that's pretty cool. I mean, that, again, this is come, kind of coming out of nowhere. It's my personal take, but it's cool to see the redwoods doing all right despite these massive fires. Um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, they serve as some kind of a, a sanctuary for species to, to come back up. But of course, fires are cyclical. These things happen every once in a while. In our next story, CDC has warned that retail and service workers should not argue with anti-maskers, warning that they could be threatened or assaulted for trying to enforce the wearing of masks. And in my last story, just hours after the first confirmed case of reinfection was identified in Hong Kong, researchers reported a woman in Belgium had got the virus a second time. And soon after that, researchers in the Netherlands had given their confirmation that a man had been identified. The third man, a third person identified reinfected with coronavirus. I don't know why all of this stuff is coming out within just a couple of days. I don't, I don't think it's that like an embargo has been lifted. It, you know, the conspiracy theorists will allege that there's a plot. Uh, it could be that there's a new discovery or that there's some way of verifying it or some technique um, that, you know, once once it's sort of proven, other people start to use it and pretty soon they're finding stuff. I don't know exactly what it is. I was trying to, trying to figure it out. If you know, you can give us a call. We'll be taking it in about two, uh, 10 minutes, 202-521-1320 is the number. Again, 202-521-1320. But those are the headlines. That's the news. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. And again, we're going to go straight into Jamal's monologue. Jamal, what is on your mind? What are you talking about today? So there are several stories that I can hit on today. Um, I think I'm going to hit on two. One briefly and the other one to give a little bit more context to something I was saying yesterday. So the first one I want to hit on has to do with a clip. Now, I don't think we have that clip that's available because it was kind of short notice. But basically, look, my white brothers who are standing out there with us on the Black Lives Matter lines, I honestly do appreciate you. Don't misunderstand me. So this is a good friend that disapproves but understands. But you are doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. Now, in a scene, this is on Twitter. In a scene that played out several times on Monday, a Black Lives Matter protest that began in Columbia Heights confronted white diners outside of the D.C. restaurant chanting, white silence is violence, and demanding that white diners show their solidarity. Now, this is a gentleman on Twitter named Frederick Kuki, um, Washington Post. He's a Washington Post staff writer. He's the one who's recording this. He said, Adam Morgan and protesters screamed at Lauren B. Victor for several minutes for refusing to raise the fist with them. Now, if you could see the Twitter video, it's basically people who are at a diner, who are just sitting at that diner, eating or trying to, and a mob of people descend upon them and start screaming at the height of their lungs. The video, the only thing you would hear basically is screaming. And you would hear, you know, white silence is violence and everything else. Now, Adam Morgan, they screamed at Victor for several minutes for refusing to raise their fists with them, the power fists. Are you a Christian? A female protester demanded, good for you. You stood your ground. Chuck Mordano said sarcastically as the crowd moved on. Mordano, who had been yelling at Victor and moments later identified himself as a citizen journalist who writes for Deadspin, told Victor he couldn't understand why she, would, was, why she was the only diner in the area who wouldn't comply. What was in you? You couldn't do this. Think about that. Oh, by the way, I forgot. These people were white, meaning the protesters. If you watch the video, the protesters, the more animated of the protesters, are white. This puts me in a mind like Worf or on Star Trek. Or basically, Worf was raised by human parents. And because he was raised by human parents, there was a thing in him that had this tendency to go overboard in Cleon traditions. I appreciate solidarity. Don't misunderstand me. What I don't appreciate is this. This was uncalled for. This was basically a mob. And I hate to tell you this, if the person didn't want to raise their hand, their fists, or whatever else that you wanted to, to comply, they didn't have to. You were basically being violent towards people who are sitting there eating. If you want to use that level of mob mentality, if you want to use that level of white solidarity, they're with you, brother. But use it against people with power. You don't know these people at all. That person could have been sitting there talking about a relative that was dying of cancer. And you came screaming like howler monkeys trying to get them to comply. It's one thing. They might have even agreed with you under normal circumstances. 
I got to be honest, if that was me, I wouldn't have raised my hand if I was, you know, the other way around because you were trying to compel me to do it. It's a difference for me doing it on my own volition. It's another thing for you trying to compel me. It's amazing. I have no video of Martin Luther King going into diners and screaming at white diners. You're a complicity in silence or violence. If you want to do that and you want to protest, God bless. I've said on more than one occasion that this thing in me went off. Like my heart grew a thousand times when I realized that, wow, these people out there protesting is interracial and, and intersection, you know, it's intersectional politics. All for the notion of we're sick of this. And despite me believing that it was too diminutive for the number of people that were out there protesting and marching all across the world, meaning defund the police, I didn't like the politics of the sound, I did understand my point of view was that it should have been on poverty with the idea of drilling into this other stuff. Meaning you can defend the police organically if you get rid of the poverty, in which case the police department just, just becomes redundant. However, fair enough, if this was the argument that they were using, and the majority of the public understood that defund the police didn't necessarily mean to abolish or get rid of the police. It meant, let's say, using those resources for other things. When you took polling on it, if you asked the people in the abstract, meaning just bluntly, did they like the phrasing, they hated it. If you ask them, should they take money from the cops and put it towards other services, those people said yes. I don't like this. I don't like this. If you want to do this to Nancy Pelosi, God bless. If you want to do this to Chuck Schumer, God bless. If you want to go to members of Congress, the people who have power, and point out to them that all of these darkies are dying two or three to one, maybe Medicare for all is a good thing. Those are things that I would approve of because at that point, at least you're going towards people with power that have the ability to actually do something. This is not. This is the lazy common denominator protesting that doesn't necessarily get to the nub of what you're even protesting. I get it. But when I look at my world, I think of all the things that we need to make this world better. And to me, that doesn't necessarily go to screaming at random people that have no propensity to do any of it. March, protest, you know, make yourself known, make your signs known. I even get that for the most part, protests that are entirely peaceful are basically neutered without the threat of violence. I even get that. So this is not me looking at this from this kind of point of view that's um, purely ideological or purely Pollyannish. I'm looking at this from the point of view and saying, this is not helpful. This is not helpful. This doesn't help me. This doesn't help the African Americans in that area. Do you realize that they rescinded a um, bill that was passed? Basically, the, in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. passed a um, minimum wage law that removed this kind of, I think it was called um, Initiative 77, that basically allowed minimum wage for waiters, restauranteurs, people who were working at these um, places. Now, consider for the moment, these are low-wage workers. These are people who barely make ends meet on the best of days. The initiative was passed, and Congress, or you could say um, the, 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 the city council, rescinded it. Now, what's more important? I understand that you want to say white silence is violence and everything else, but there are a lot of people who are working in D.C. that are poor, that were made poor by that initiative. Now, I get that you want to show solidarity and you want to show it in a very explicit way and you want people to express solidarity in a very explicit way that you want them to express solidarity as opposed to the things that they may be doing on their own that may be advancing the cause. Fair enough. But I hate to tell you this, those people there you were harassing, the diners that you were harassing at that particular restaurant, you don't know those people from a hole in the wall. And as opposed to you fighting to say, look, we want to ensure that people make the ends that they need to make, that they aren't living on um, minimum wage, that they are getting paid for the work that they're doing. That's an aspect of fighting on. You could have been protesting that. My point is there are ways to go about this that are beneficial in ways that are not. And there are ways that are advanced interests. And there are ways that are not. I'm sorry. This isn't one of them. I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate the good intentions. I even appreciate that you went into this on some level, thinking that you were fighting for somebody like you were, you know, as if you were fighting for yourself. But put a little more thought into your actions. Put a little more thought into things that are effective versus things that are not, and the things that you want to accomplish versus the things that take you backwards. What I'm trying to point out to you is that I have no issue 
with you doing something in a sense of solidarity. I have no issue with you doing things in a sense of fighting for what you consider to be equal rights and everything else for the standpoint of society, and you feel that that is a mission. And you're right. That is a God-given cosmic mission to expand the freedoms and the liberties of the various people in your society. I applaud you for the sentiment. I don't applaud you for the action. Don't do this. Find ways to be effective in your protests. Find ways to be loud. Find ways to get your point across. Find interesting and, and, and particular, peculiar ways of trying to advance your interests. I'm telling you, that doesn't. That's aggressive. That's violent. And for all that person know, you were in their space and you could have at any point attacked them. I don't approve of this. And not only do I not approve of it, it's not helpful. You guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas Strain a hand, we'll be back in a moment. Fault lines. Tune in every Friday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a weekly segment of the worst mainstream media headlines of the week. They tell us what's behind the worst, most misleading, and funniest headlines from around the news with Steve Pat of the blog Left Eye on the News. Together, they pull apart the corporate media's bias, spin, and downright lies. Tune in this Friday and every Friday for the worst and most misleading headlines of the week. We are talking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You are listening. We give you the most essential out of the endless information space. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Fault Lines. And we're back, and you're listening to us. We're, up, we're on fault lines with Thomas and Stranahan, Jamarl Thomas and I, Shane Stranahan. We're taking calls, 202-521-1320. But first, I want to come back and talk for a second about what Jamarl was talking about in his monologue. Um, so Jamarl was talking about the, these videos that have been circulating about events that played out on Monday, apparently. This looks like Monday night. Have when you seen that? Have you seen the video? Was dying. I have. I've, okay, seen, yeah, I've seen a few different ones. And I was kind of looking back into it, too, while you were talking about it. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd seen those. hadn't hadn't known that those were in DC, um, but but yeah, no. That, I mean, you said you said a bunch of stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna cover a couple of things that you didn't say. So, um, as far as I can tell, there are a few few main sources. Twitter, who shared a few videos um, that were right widely retweeted. He's like a blue check, and you know, seventeen thousand something likes, twenty something thousand retweets. He shared a couple of videos, and in that thread, he's talking about. Who the woman is uh she's an urban planner she's saying that she had been protesting for weeks and weeks and weeks with the protesters in other words she was on their side but that at, in that moment she said she felt like she was under attack and basically a little bit not not frightened so much just as coerced that she felt like she was being coerced and that it didn't feel right in that moment to to show that protest or to, she was. to show support in that way to to the for the protesters um the other thing though um I can't verify this, but in the last video, and I haven't, I hadn't watched this before, and it's 20 seconds long or something like that, and it's loud, so it's hard to tell. But the dude who's mm -hmm. posting this thread is saying, it's worth noting, and I'll just quote from him directly, it's worth noting that a young black woman leading the protest Monday asked white protesters to step forward, as seen here. Um, in the, and I'll just end, end that quote there. In the video, you can see kind of coming up from a side, a woman who might be a, a, the leader of a protest, she's certainly sort of getting central in it. And maybe, you know, he was following it, and so he had identified her. I, I don't know about that, but I can see that. It's not just white protesters, but it, it is predominantly white protesters. That doesn't matter. I like to hear you pushing back on this kind of thing because I'm also opposed to this. But it's like we also had riots. You know, people were killed in Kenosha last night. That's not the same yeah. thing as the protest, but it's hard to have this conversation. I don't know how we are supposed to have this conversation. Um, well, because, like, if, we could talk if, about the Kenosha one. I mean, right I wanted that critical. separate. But go ahead. You know, if the right is critical of the rioting, which there is some of, obviously, um, if the right matter. is critical of the rioting, then people on the left will tend to defend it as, stop. You know, you're attacking, you're attacking some of the worst excesses of the protesters. Stop attacking the, the protests. And sometimes the right, the people on the right or people in the center, or whatever, who are saying this stuff, are attacking the protesters. But sometimes they aren't. They're just, you know, speaking right. critically of the rioting. But if, if when they do that, it's seen as attacking the protests, or if it's seen as unjust to attack the protests based on the rioting, which is a separate conversation, 
it's hard to have that conversation. Now, is it sh should we judge the protesters based on the rioting? Should we judge them based on how they respond to, to the rioting? How much of the protesting is actually leading to rioting or how many of the protesters are actually doing the rioting? I'm, you know, there are a bunch of different answers to those questions. Um, but my point is, it's like there's so many so many parts of this that we don't talk about or that are hard to talk about that make the rest of it really difficult to make it as far as I can tell almost impossible makes it incredibly polarized. There's something obviously like in the whole ambient emotional atmosphere that leads to that. But it's weird, man. Mm -hmm. And we're you know, we're on the front lines of it. We're uh, we're fault lines. So we'll get into well, it. We I are would... taking calls 202-521-1320. But it's, it's an interesting thing to look into when you're trying to understand human dynamics, literally in that abstract sense. I don't know. What's your take tomorrow? But keep in mind, extreme extremes produce extremes, right? Like when I look at this stuff, I look at this stuff and I place it in a sense of um, taking an opinion on it is hard. Or an opinion from right or wrong. Because ultimately you get into the situation of our life in this country and honestly around the world. We live in extremes. I mean, think of people um, not uh, a perfect example. One example. Let's say you have a family. Let's say that better yet, better example. Take what took place in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and don't look at it in the sense of right, wrong, good, bad. Don't even add any attributes from the individuals that are involved in it. Just look at it from the standpoint of you have cops. They're fighting a guy. That guy gets up, tries to get in his car and gets shot. Now, for the moment, go through the heads of each of those groups in the morning when they woke up that morning. Like, do you think that Jacob Blake got up that morning thinking, I'm going to be paralyzed the next day? Or do you think those cops got in the car saying, I'm going to paralyze somebody? I don't. What I do think is that cops have in their heads issues of authority and you give them a gun. And the moment that they have the gun, they feel a certain license to use it, especially when they know 99% get off. By the same token, Jacob Blake, I look at that and say, God, don't brawl with the cops. By the same token, I say, God, don't shoot them. I look at it in both ways, right? Yeah. Because I know what's going to take place the moment that he does anything. He can wink wrong. And the people, you're going to have all these people who say, well, it was a clean shoot. He shouldn't have winked at the cop. Um, and by the same token, I think that cop is still a person. And I think that person as a human being have all sorts of drives in them. Some of those are cultural from the standpoint of the organization to which they're working in, many cops, and this authority thing that they have. You're resisting my authority. Maximum justice immediately behind it. But you also have this notion that that guy is there to do a job. And it's almost like you have to kind of respect the fact that he's there to do a job. By the same token, not accepting that they can do that job with flagrant indifference to life. And I think that's where the arguments come in. I, I don't. The guy we had on yesterday, um, I made the point to him that there was a video that a cop told the guy to go get his license and the cop shot him. Um, he came for me on Twitter in which I showed him the video. Here's the video. Exactly as I said. Um, I understand they're scared. I understand they don't know uh, what that person may or may not do. I get all that. But they decided to do that job. And then decided to do that job that doesn't give complete license to flagrantly ignore potentially other options in lieu of maximum justice. That's my issue, right? And so when I'm talking about this, I don't need to deify or change the characters of the people that are involved. If this guy has a criminal record, so what? If that guy did something wrong at some point, so what? It comes down to, does a person, is a person a life? Does a person have people who care about them and love them? And whatever is taking place, it could be the cop's fault. It could be the guy's fault that instigates. But ultimately, is that a human life? And does that human life have value that you, at the very least, a wisp of you wants to preserve? So I don't need to, you know, make this guy an angel or make that guy an angel. I don't need to do any of that stuff. I look at it from the responsibility of the job. I look at it from the standpoint of, does life matter? Does life have value? And should we treat that life with value? Look at Tamir Rice. Tamir Rice was a 12 year old playing with a, a toy gun. The cop shoots him within the two seconds. He can't even, you know, doesn't even know what's going on. The guy with the license, the other guy that was in Walmart, that was playing with a, you know, messing with a gun that was legal in Walmart, cop shoots him in a few seconds. Breonna Taylor, no knock warrant that is illegal or dubious at best where they throw open the door and when somebody fires at them because they are goons knocking down somebody's door, they unleash. They shot through their house into the neighbor's apartment or to the neighbor's place. Like I'm trying to make the point to you that there is something fundamentally wrong with the police force that's supposed to be protect and serve and they kill a thousand people a year. Either 
there's something wrong with your society that is creating people to the point where cops have to have this kind of judge dread maximum justice type of mentality or there's something wrong with your cops or a little bit of both whatever that is prayers i don't care about good feelings i don't care about good sense i don't care about none of that stuff when i see that it feels like a family member it's like a family member because they see it so often the thing that blacks need to answer is whether or not they're okay with dying at the same rate as whites by cops. Meaning, if cops kill a thousand people a year, fair enough. Blacks only make up 13% of the population. At this point, Hispanics make it 15%, even more. So are you okay with dying at the rate of whites by cops? Is that acceptable? Or is there something fundamentally wrong with the way we do criminal justice in and of itself where this number of people shouldn't be dying regardless? Because I'm telling you this, you will not be content with dying at the rate that whites die by cops either. You just won't. And so it's like, yeah, it's difficult to talk about. It's complicated to talk about. But that's life. It doesn't give you any way else, right? And you try to put your stake in the ground. You. And you I, I mean, be earnest and, and fair, talk. you know. We can talk about. No, no, I mean, go ahead. I was, I was finished. I was just saying, you know, you try to be earnest and fair, but you try to do your best in, in discussing it. Yeah. And I mean, I think that there's definitely room for that in the conversation. Sadly, it seems like the conversation has been dominated by the protests that turn into riots in some cases and yeah. all of the, you know, between that and then people disagreeing over the facts of the shootings and the facts of what happened with George Floyd, these different things. That's the, the conversation isn't what you're talking about. It's not which of these hundred different like reforms of the police system should we implement? You know, which which of these would be best in, in these different ways? That's not where the conversation is. And I wish the conversation were there. I think part of the, the reason the conversation isn't there is that we're stuck having these these other things because people are dying in the streets because uh, I don't even I don't even know why because people are acting emotionally volatile because they think that this makes sense I I'll put it up uh, this is probably controversial to say but protest as a form of political engagement uh, you know you, you have voting you have protesting and those shouldn't be it and it feels like people are are, are sort of seeing those as the only two choices. The, the, yeah. Where you should spend like 95 to 98 percent of your political political activity, as far as I can tell, is building up your own organizations, building up some some local, probably, but what, whether it's local or regional or wherever it's operating, some organization on your scale. And if I I, I don't know, man, I, maybe I'm criticizing people who have already done that, and and that might be a valid criticism. But I kind of feel like I'm not. I kind of feel like if you look at the history of the Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of what's kept it back is that you haven't had enough organization. You haven't had enough people creating these. You've had local leaders, but those local leaders, if you fan the flames, those can get out of hand pretty quickly. So whether it was like Ferguson back in 2014 or whether it's stuff that's going on today, I feel like if you had more leadership, more sort of local leadership, more established organizations, more centralization, and a real alternative that wasn't dependent on the DNC and you did that stuff, and there were less protesting in the streets and less rioting and more like, I don't know what the alternative is but more passing laws, more creating alternative systems, more like educating people and creating new leaders who will become in 10 years leaders in the establishment, that kind of thing. I could see that activity making real changes. As it is, this stuff just seems to be muddying the waters. Um, um, we've got a call. I think right you're, you are well, wait, real quick. I, th I think you're undermining um, the emotional impact of trauma and of what you consider to be not just trauma, but injustice. It has an energy on its own. And if it looks like the social contract is not being honored when the lives of various people in your society are being wiped away, I mean, for God's sake, Tamir Rice or, or um, Trevon Martin, I mean, the guy's walking home with his lemonade. Or um, what is the guy who was, they, they chased in a pickup truck, killed him, and then the other one took a picture of his dead body as he laid there and put it on Sorry Snapchat? About a, a yeah, Amon Aubrey. I, I guess I'm making the point that that's injustice and that bites. Now, you can look at it in a cerebral way. But many people look at it and say, I am angry. And they have every right to be angry. And they respond. That's what I mean when I say extremes creates extremes. It's not that I love it. I don't think any of those people want to be out there in the streets like that. I'm pretty sure they have better things to do. They're out there because they're angry and they're pissed off. And I'm not going to take this kind of overtly cerebral approach in discussing it. Well, I mean, that's not, that's we have to take a break. So let's... let's we, we've, yeah. I know. What you, I, know yeah. I mean, you're trying to come up with solutions for it, right? So I get it. But it just comes across as a cerebral way for something that is deeply emotional and traumatizing. That's all. Let's take a break. And That's we can come back to this if you want. Exactly.
Yeah, we'll talk yeah, about that later. It. We have Dr. Mikhail Kogan on coming in just a second. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We will be right back. Fault Lines. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Shooting from the lip. We're taking no prisoners here. Real opinions for real people. So where we bring you people with controversial views, and instead of trying to catch them out, we actually let them expand on their views. What's going on in British politics, European politics, and indeed in world politics as well. Oh, and wherever you are, whether you're a UKIP supporter, a Tory, or Labour, everything is in turmoil. John Gaunt, shooting from the lip. Stuck in traffic? No problem. Stay informed. Stay tuned to Radio Sputnik on 105.5 FM or 1390 AM in the Washington, D.C. area. Need more? Follow us on Facebook or check us out on SputnikNews.com. Fault Lines. And we're back. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. You know what? We've got Dr. Kogan on, but we have to recalling in. Therese, you called in. We didn't get to your last segment. We're going we're to bring you on, but we've got to go to our guests. Could you please um, you probably usually bring in a couple of points. Let's go through those. But thank you for the call. What's on your mind, Therese? I got one comment. Um, it's dealing with the exports to China. Um, the U.S. exports to China. Okay, the, the most we sell to them is our civilian aircraft that we make here. That's $16 billion. Then it's the Serbines, it's twelve billion, cars ten billion, and circuit boards, right, is five billion. The car industry have a large potential to um to increase because um, just need one minute call and drop. Yes, the dollar you are correct, the dollar is is expensive and yes our products do cost money to, to um to get I me mean, to um buy, but at the same time you do have a market in China that still buy American goods, and the reason why it's not too many goods have been sold over there is because, you know, China's trying to deal with its own manufacturers and, and to protect them, and that's why I think Trump is trying to fight to open up their Kogan own is back. economy so we can sell more goods to them, you know, and so forth and so forth. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say, bro. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the call, Tariq. No, you, you make great points. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, you brought up, you brought up, uh, I think it was a computer industry uh, the disparity there between us and, and China, also South Korea. I mean, with, with us in China specifically, uh, I, I, you, brought, you brought up how they are buying American goods. As far as I can tell, the, the sense is that, it, it, you know, American Americans do produce quality goods, but they're also expensive. And, and again, that does relate back to the reserve currency thing. So that's another topic. We can we can do that when we have more time. Sorry for not taking your call last segment, but thank you for the call, as always, Tariq. We have Dr. Kogan on, Dr. Mikhail Kogan, medical director at the George Washington Center for Integrative Medicine, also the associate professor of medicine at George Washington University, and the founder and executive director of the AIM Health Institute, that is a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit delivering integrative services to the underserved. Dr. Kogan, thank you for joining us this morning. How are you doing? Good morning. Uh, it's good to be back from uh, a little time in wilderness. Hope everybody can do it once in a while. I'm planning on that soon. I didn't. I didn't know. Where'd you go? Uh, we went kayaking on this little river in Maine called Saint Croix, which separates. Uh, actually, we were right on border with Canada. In fact, we had to camp out in Canada one time because we couldn't find a camping site on the American border. So, you know, practically, I think we have violated. Canadian quarantine, <laughs> but uh, we haven't had seen a soul there for <laughs> several days. So I think Canadian Canadians will forgive us. That is hilarious. You know, an American alien in Canada. That is great. No, I hope I hope you had a great time. I've been I was uh, kayaking up in Big Bear. I'm staying down in Southern California. I went kayaking up there a couple weekends ago. But uh, yeah, good to get outside. Anyway, we're we're very very happy to have you. Thank you again for joining us. Talking about COVID, of course, as always, I'll start off with this. We're, we're going to move into the topic in a second of uh, the sort of state of play with COVID right now, whether death totals are leveling off, new infections, how to sort of look at the system of this virus and learn where we are, where things are going to go, at least as best as we can. 
But the big things come out over the last couple of days relates to this um, has to do with reinfection. So over in Hong Kong, the, uh, what I hear is, and I, I've been talking months ago about various suspicions, sort of in, increasingly confident suspicions that it was possible for people to be reinfected with the coronavirus. Um, and then it seems that this weekend we've had the first sort of internationally recognized confirmed case in Hong Kong. Since then, we've had a few more in Belgium, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Kogan, I'm sure you've been following this. What should we, what, what do you know about this and what should we take away from this, this news coming out over the last couple of days about reinfection by COVID? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think this information has been kind of floating around for a while. Uh, there's been suspicions of this for, I'd say, at least weeks, if not several months. So I think that first Hong Kong, and I read it in the stat, um, so I think that first confirmed case is not surprising. It's a relatively young person um, in 30s. You know, he had it in March, and then he had it four and a half months later uh, while traveling in Europe. Um, so I think we were just simply waiting for this to occur. It, it's very consistent with the data of a couple of weeks ago that um, antibodies, the protective antibodies that we make, if the case is relatively mild, so if the disease during um, the first episode did not have a lot of symptoms, the antibodies don't last for more than several weeks, uh, maybe, maybe up to three months. It's very consistent with this logic that simply after a couple of months, suddenly you can get infected again. And of course, it, it puts the vaccine into a major question, right? I mean, if the vaccine is going to generate similar mild immune response and only going to last for a short period of time, then, you know, we're either going to have to have multiple revaccinations, which is going to make everything much more complicated, um, you know, or possibly even that vaccine simply won't be effective enough because you won't know exactly what time frame to, um, you know, one person make have the antibodies, protective antibodies lost just for several months and another person for several weeks. I mean, we don't frankly know. I think the suggestive data is such that it's three months or so for now. And it's the immunity, think, basically. Data, we, yeah, and, you know, it, it appears that people who had a more severe illness protected longer, but Again, we don't know either because there's simply no controlled studies yet. And this is also a situation where obviously we're not going to have controlled studies for a while because, you know, there's not been enough basically time. basically trying to rush a vaccine. Right, right, right. Let me ask you this. They had, uh, I was looking at, um, you know, people for whatever reason had this religious belief that kids weren't vectors or couldn't get sick. Um, Alabama reports 566 cases at the start of class. And Florida has an astonishing 9,000 new COVID-19 cases among children within 15 days the school reopens. Um, I can go from state to state and state and point this out. I didn't necessarily know why people thought the biology of children was somehow radically different from the biology of other uh, people. But what does this tell us? I mean, if you're, if you're looking at this and you're advising anybody that's in the school system and you see numbers that are this high, 9,000 kids, and I understand Florida is a really big state, but con considering Trump put out on Twitter that kids couldn't necessarily get sick, well, that's pretty astonishing. What should they do? I mean, how do you deal with that at this point? Is it one of those things we say, look, we need to stop the school stuff and we need to break, take these kids and let these kids do remote learning? Or do you allow it? I mean, with this, I mean it, it just seems untenable to allow that to proceed. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, remember we talked about this some weeks ago when this, you know, when Maryland announced that they're going to do the school virtual until uh, January next year. Uh, and, you know, I, I told you I agreed with that from the start. I mean, whether some components can be done face to face in a relatively careful way, I think that's definitely an option. But I, I don't think there's, we're not. There's nothing new we're discussing right now in contrast to the prior question, right? I mean, we knew that there is a significant transmission from kids. The younger the kids, the transmission is less, but the data just came out. We just had a study that kids under 10, the transmission is about 5%. So they, even if they're not themselves showing symptoms, they're going to infect 
other people, you know, and then in, in kids over 10, the transmission can be up to 20%. That's quite significant. That's not that far different from adult transmission, you know. So, and, you know, they only did this, I guess, artificial cutoff at, at, at 10 years of age. But, you know, if you open the school, how do you separate all that? I mean, are you going to allow right. small kids before 10? That doesn't make any sense. You know, whether transmission is 5% of 20, it's still high enough to infect a lot of people. And what do you tell to the teachers? You're sending them to front line like doctors with no protection? I mean, you know, if we go to a possibly infected room when we know there is a patient with a positive COVID, we wear full protective suit. Are you going to ask that to have teachers wearing all the time working? I don't know. I mean, are you going to provide them with the correct protective equipment probably not so i don't i don't think there's any choice for all this places for all these states but to say look yeah we screwed up understand and we have to go back we have to close the schools or at least we have to create some modification we have to do hybrid programs where you know you're you're the kids are all socially distant enough in the classrooms uh, a lot of classes are transitioned to completely online those that can and certain workshops that cannot be, they have limited number of kids in the class. Uh, they're all maintaining social distancing. They're all masked. You know, common common sense, right? I mean, you know, I think we can sort of say, look, Florida screwed up majorly. We can learn a lot about it from them. Um, you know, half a million cases. It's sad. And, and you know, they were at the lowest rate just a few months ago. And, you know, what happened, well, what happened was what, what was supposed to happen. You know, if you, if you don't put the standard public health initiatives in to protect your citizens, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, it, it was smart, quote-unquote, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, to cut down public health budget in Florida. And, you know, Florida government said, oh, you know, we don't need this. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, it, to me, this all looks like Statewide malpractice, and you know, people get sued for malpractice. Whether that's what's and, and you, there, I don't know. Doctor Kogan, where are you going to looking at this from from your perspective as a doctor? Where do you distribute your blame? You're talking about state malpractice. There, you you looking federally right. too? I'm guessing you can indict Trump on some of this stuff. But where where are you if you're looking at the remember, U.S.'s response in a in a vacuum, sort of in our bubble? Yeah. Um, where are you going to apportion credit and blame? <laughs> You're not asking me a political question. I'm telling you what I'm from. from <laughs> okay. From, from physics, there's a gross mouth on, on a some level of government in there. You know, who's responsible? I, you know, they're going to have to figure it out. But I, I don't know. I mean, okay, I agree with enough. you. I think okay. there should be lawsuits. And what's your perspective? Honestly. I want to move back actually yeah. to... Um, just the to total your total perspective on the situation right now, and not not just political. I'd forgotten it. It'd been a couple of weeks since we'd had you on for the first time. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, we can we can steer somewhat clear of that stuff. But with the the total COVID deaths, um, we'd seen about a month and a half ago the beginnings of what some people were calling a second wave. There was obviously argument over whether that term applied. At this point, deaths seem to have we sort of going through this longer term oscillation, nowhere near as high as the peak back in um, early May late April, nowhere near as high as the thousands of people dying in a lot of cases every day, but in some cases anywhere between hundreds and a bit over a thousand people dying in the last couple of weeks. Where does that leave us now? Obviously, this is really extending out, um, uh, you know, the, the duration of time that we're going to have to take to deal with this virus. But but what's your opinion on on where we are now? Are you expecting a second wave this winter? Um, what, are, what are you watching for, Dr. Kogan? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think, I think this whole idea somehow there's going to be first and second wave in my in my personal opinion my humble personal opinion this just was incorrect from the get-go i think we may be seeing ups and downs are we going to see it we were luckily in the down period right now are we going to see an up again because the fall is coming let's wrap in 30 there's going to be people going to be more potentially indoors even more you know there's there, there's going to be flu coming so are people going to get sick from both that's the potentially they're going to have more symptoms. Uh, they may be thinking they're having a flu and they may not bring this up too early. Um, Dr. Kogan, let me interrupt you. I apologize. Yeah. We're going to bring you into the next break. You guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. 
We're with Dr. Kogan, medical director at the George Washington Center for Integrative Medicine, associate professor of medicine at George Washington University, and the founder and executive director of the AIM Health Institute. We'll be back in a moment. Fault lines. Epidemics and pandemics could kill millions of people, and they actually did. Centuries ago, deadly outbreaks called the Black Death, the Plague of Justinian, and the Spanish flu ravaged countries, empires, and whole continents. Some of these diseases are still present around the globe. Others have become a thing of the past. Discover how these ancient and not so distant outbreaks from previous centuries differ from modern day SARS, MERS and coronavirus pandemics. Listen to our new series, Outbreak, the deadliest epidemics in human history. This week on Radio Sputnik. Fault Lines. Welcome back to Fault Lines. My name is Jamal Thomas. I am here with my co-host, Shane Stranahan. Joining us is medical doctor, uh, medical director at George Washington Center for Integrative Medicine, associate professor of medicine at George Washington University, and founder and executive director of the AIM Health Institute, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit delivering integrative services to the undeserved, Dr. Mikhail Kogan. Um, Dr. Kogan, do we know anything different? Like meaning from the time frame, I think one of the most interesting aspects of the COVID-19 thing has been science in the open. Like under normal circumstances, when people are looking at a study, they're looking at it in the rear view mirror. Whereas, so they're like, oh, okay, the study is polished. You've had multiple studies to replicate the information and ensure that this is what we have. We have a pretty decent theory, et cetera. COVID wasn't like that. And you had all of these studies going on all at the same time. And you had a preponderance of studies that ended up in a particular place and some that didn't. And people would get, I think, somewhat confused in regards to the information that was being put out because so much information was being put out at once. Um, is there anything new um, just in the context of the studies and the um, investigation and the research that has been taking place on COVID-19 that we know of that, let's say, we didn't know last month or the month before last? Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of new stuff coming out almost every week. And, and, you know, this is a situation where you're absolutely right. Science constantly changes, but not because for some reason, you know, we're doing something necessarily completely wrong. It's because, you know, it's in a situation like this where it's so acute and there's so many studies going out simultaneously, there's, there's of course, a good possibility that some percent of the study is going to have erroneous results. But more importantly, because things are changing, some of the science may change. I mean, we talked about how in the beginning, there, we just talked about this a couple of minutes ago, when in the beginning it was assumed that once you're infected, you're infected, and that's it, right? So that was based on the prior data, um, and, you know, with a lot of pandemic viruses, like, they were based, some of it was based on the prior flu epidemics, and it was wrong, right? So in flu, usually you don't get reinfected twice in the same year. Turns out that with this virus, you can't. Um, so the things like this going to change. I think what's not going to change is certain things based on the core principles of how um, the science evolves uh, during any new pandemic. And that's simply, you know, when the data accumulates, the other scientists can look at this data and can say, look, all right, well, this is, we're going to base now next level of research on a preliminary prior data, you know, which you don't have in the first weeks. And after a few months, you have. Uh, but, you know, there's an explosion of science. What's really positive, I say, is that we see the tremendous amount of sharing of information. And I think that's shifted. Uh, I think previously we haven't seen this amount of capacity due to our being so electronically connected to have some of the results published in one place or, or even before it published, which is what what's sort of fascinating, you know, Previously, we had, you know, the, the, in order for you to publish a study, and I've done this many times to go through what's called a peer review process, you have to get accepted. And, and that it took a while. You know, you have to 
submit revisions back to the your reviewers. Your reviewers may potentially have two or three rounds of revisions. By the time your article is accepted, I had situations where it took months, you know, six months. So here we have something quite different because of the acuity and importance. You can actually get something published, literally a preliminary data before it was peer reviewed. So your 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 study that you finished, say on August first, you could write it up and get published in a couple of weeks, which is unprecedented. Now, because of because of that, of course, you know, scientists are people after all. And of course, not everybody 100. percent You know, they're going to have other potential uh, reasons to publish something rather than just being pure science. And so, yeah, we we definitely have seen several episodes of situations where the science was you know, I don't want to say fake. I, I don't actually know whether indeed it was fake, but you know, there was data that was completely wrong. Remember the study in, that was published in a, one of the most prestigious English journals uh, about hydroxychloroquine had a, lots of deadly side effects. Um, that was wrong, right? And then we all used that data even in the at the presentation in our own Department of Medicine, that, that that study was cited as a key study to not prescribe hydroxychloroquine. Now, of course, there are other reasons why we don't prescribe hydroxychloroquine, but that early study was then later said that it was withdrawn from the journal due to ethical problems. So, you know, I guess it's not surprising because science takes time. Good science takes more and more time. And science is a slow process, and, and, you know, it's a process that has its own baseline and its own um, quality built in. So if we're trying to speed anything up, we're going to potentially have more results in more science, but we're probably going to sacrifice some quality. That's, that's just what's based, what's basically is science, how it's based on what we, we often call an evidence-based approach. Um, you know, and and I think we're going to keep learning more and more. I think one of the most critical aspects, of course, everybody's waiting for whether science of the new vaccine, and there are 100, 170 plus, you know, how that's going to pan out. Because I think without vaccine, yes, sure, it's great that we're dropping daily rate of infections quite significantly over the last couple of weeks. But, you know, that doesn't mean the disease is going to plateau completely. Down to well, nothing. that's what I was going to ask about the vaccine. If they did have a vaccine, what about variations? Like if the, if the, for example, it, you know, one of the things that they were talking about where there were different strains of COVID-19, obviously, I mean, it's a living thing. It mutates. And as it mutates, does it mutate in a way where the vaccine itself no longer becomes viable? I mean, like, the, like I guess my thought is, yes, you get a vaccine. But is it possible that they get a vaccine and it's not it doesn't work in the way that we think it works, or it's less effective than we think it's going to be, just due to the mutation by itself. Yeah, I mean, I think it's possible. I think it's very possible. I mean, I think there's also one of the, at least one of the vaccines, the Moderna vaccine, the RNA vaccine. You know, that's a totally different principle of vaccine, which is supposed to at least partially protect against the mutations. But in reality, we don't really have clarity what's going to happen you know I, I think it's a new virus in a way even though of course it, you know it's based on a very well understood class of viruses that was causing previously regular um what are cold you know but unfortunately i don't think we know i i think it's possible that just like with the flu vaccine um the efficacy is going to be lower than we're hoping um, you know, it's possible that the, the vaccine manufacturer is going to have to continuously modify it. You know, it's also possible that we're simply going to transition into just living with a new virus for decades going forward. It, in fact, that is my prediction, that this virus is going to evolve into just another flu that, well, I don't know, not flu, corona, or flu. And... You know, and we're going to have to live with this every year. There's going to be another shot, just like we have a flu shot every year that are different from the year before. And that's because vaccine mutates. But, you know, this virus is in some ways a little more stable from my understanding 
than some of the other viruses, but it doesn't mean that we know what is going to happen. I think, unfortunately, we're all going to be living a large scientific experiment in the next couple of months, seeing how it's all going to pan out. I think we're all hopeful. I, I think my understanding is that the hope is that the vaccine is going to be somewhere around 50% efficacious. Now, let, let's put that in a context. So the flu vaccine in the last couple of years have ranged anywhere from 25% in about 50% efficacy at the beginning of the flu season. Now, but at the end of the flu season, the flu vaccine could have been less than 10% efficacious. Now, does that mean you don't give it to somebody who's at high risk? No, because you don't have any other mechanism to try to protect them in a way or, or easy mechanism. And so, you know, we're going to have to see what it's going to look like. Now, it will be really sad if the efficacy is going to be really low. And that would mean that not only we'll have to get more vaccines and wait for more vaccine development, but. You know, it's also going to mean that we're simply not going to keep at leveling down number of cases the way we would. You know, because the whole point is even if disease doesn't go away, but the number of cases becomes so small that we're simply going to have this as a occasional occurrence. And we can mostly go to our living as we used to and then just simply watch carefully, trace contact isolate when needs to be and you know just like any other viral infection you know where with a good public health and, and again we can go back to prior question debate all that but you know let's 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 be optimistic and think of the best in terms of that you know but we that sounds that thing. sounds like a good resumption that sounds like a good a good return I, w- I would want that i think pretty much everybody would want that but again we're also that does sound optimistic and not, not like pan and it's not super optimistic but um Something like a return to normal still seems very far away. Um, the lockdown has right. hit, our, obviously, our economy very hard. I'm curious, how do you think it will change the healthcare industry? Well, I mean, that's a million-dollar question. If I think if I'd be clear about it, I may be <laughs> changing jobs. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I think, well, the first thing is obvious. I, I think the telemedicine is here to stay. What's really fascinating, by the way, do you guys aware that the, prior to COVID, and it should sound obvious, but it's not. If you, if I were to give a phone call to a patient of mine, and let's just take Medicare, CMS, Medicare, Medicaid. Medicare, Medicaid didn't pay a penny for it, not zip. So I could spend an hour with the patient educating about something. I wouldn't have paid nothing. You know, and it took a COVID for Medicare to say, oh, yeah, sure, we're going to cover all that. But why not before? Why not to have a system a lot more optimized to a patient experience. What is there? What is the problem? There? Well, the problem is there that our healthcare system is extremely inefficient. It's one of the least efficient healthcare system in the entire developed world. You know, and so one silver lining here is that COVID's going to shift us because it's pretty obvious that in a cre- in a crisis in a major public health crisis like this, a lot of things got pushed up front, and so. Telemedicine is going to hear today. I think there's going to be a lot of innovation around that. I think there's going to be a lot of delivery of information based on innovative telehealth. Um, like, for example, we're building a um, process where we could educate on a healthcare and wellness topics, a group of people at the same time, and then build insurances for it. You know, because in essence, that and, and prior, we couldn't do that. So our classes had to be face-to-face. It's a whole lot more complicated process. But if you don't bring anybody in the room with you, so then the next thing we have to do is then to assure that our entire public has access to it, which is a whole another issue, right? I mean, you know, people who are privileged have access to all kinds of computers and technology, and you know, people on a lower income may not. That has to happen, but that's in one major shift that's already here. What's up? We're up in thirty. Go further. I think the the issue of understanding um, the importance of certain core treatments. You know, a lot of the things have been dropped during the first few months. I mean, the hospitals didn't do elective procedures. Um, you know, but it's interesting to see, and I don't. 
Dr. Kogan, I'm sorry, we, we've got to go. We should we should have you back on yeah. to talk about this, at least among other topics. An interesting, interesting thing talking about the future of the healthcare industry after COVID. That was Dr. Mikhail Kogan, uh, founder and executive director of the AIM Health Institute over in Washington, D.C. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We'll be back in a minute with another two great hours of the most disruptive show in American politics. to Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Fault Lines. Live from the divided states of America, welcome to your daily inoculation for propaganda. In the left corner, I am the indefatigable, ever vigilant, the last antibody to a sick and seizing political system, your political analyst, Jamal Thomas. And in the independent corner, currently stationed in the desert, but really missing the mountains, I am your investigative political analyst and radio talk show host, Jane Stranahan. Let's get to the, uh, you guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. I love that in the desert for missing the mountains. That threw me off a little bit because I was like, wow, I like that. <laughs> I like what this sounds. All right, so let's get to the headlines. In the news, um, Jacob Blake family updated the public on his condition yesterday, indicating that he's paralyzed from the waist down, possibly for life. It was reported that when he awoke and he was told that he was paralyzed, that he cried and he said, I'm sorry, to which I believe it was his mom, asked him, did you shoot yourself in the back seven times? Believing that he's just not ready to go there yet in order to um, understand what's taking place. Um, in relation to that, two were killed and more were wounded in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as a military or a militia descended on protesters or rioters, depending on where you want to go with that. And yeah, it ended up with people shot and other people. Um, one interesting point on that, one of the things that started the trend on Twitter was call the police. Now, the reason that started the trend, because they were mocking the protesters that were there in, you know, backing up uh, Jacob's life and mocking them for calling the police after a right-wing militia basically descended upon him and started opening fire. On the next story, yesterday was RNC Day 2 with Eric Trump, Tiffany Trump, and Melania Trump giving speeches. Pompeo gave an address from Israel with Representative Joaquin, Joaquin Castro the Texas Democrat, who was vice chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, saying he would investigate whether address violates State Department policy and the Federal Hatch Act, which prohibits federal officials from engaging in political activity in their official capacity. That's the same Hatch Act that was also restrict Trump from giving a speech on the White House lawn, South Lawn. Angel Mom, quote unquote, Marie Ann Mendoza got pulled from the RNC after spreading a QAnon post that incorporated anti-Semitic messaging. I guess the question is, would they have pulled her if it didn't have the anti-Semitic messaging, get just the QAnon messaging? Hurricane Laura may be a Category 3 hurricane as it makes landfall, after all, with 600,000 ordered to evacuate and a storm surge warning in place across much of Louisiana's coastline. Parts of eastern Houston are also in the crossfire. China claims that the United States spy plane entered a no-fly zone on the Pacific yesterday. Jerry Falwell Jr. is reassigning from Liberty University after all, or resigning from Liberty University after all, taking home $10.5 million payout. This comes after accusations of an affair by former pool boy Giancarlo Granda. 54% of San Francisco storefronts are no longer in business with 1,200 stores still happen after 1,300 close, or still open after 1,300 close. The city's unemployment numbers are also high with claims reaching 193,000. That is four times the number of claims filed in 2008 during the Great Recession. Over in New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio said the indoor dining may not return after the arrival of the vaccine, until after the arrival of the vaccine. 
California fires are now affecting air quality as far away as parts of Colorado and Kansas. CDC has warned that retail and service workers should not argue with anti-maskers, warning that they could be threatened or assaulted for trying to enforce the wearing of the mask. Ideally, you'd think you would have security guards for that, but okay. Just hours after the first confirmed case of reinfection was identified in Hong Kong, researchers reported a woman in Belgium had caught the virus a second time, soon after researchers in the Netherlands had given their confirmation of a man being reinfected. Those are the headlines. You're up to date. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. So I want to go back to Jacob Blake uh, for a moment. His sister gave a heart-wrenching I don't, I guess you can call it speech. Um, whenever the family was giving updates on what was taking place. Uh, look, whatever you think and whatever you think, you know, is right, wrong or whatever in this process, can we accept that a human being is paralyzed? That whatever took place, that that person has a family member or family members that love him, friends that love him. I have known plenty of crooks in my life. None of them should have been killed. All of them at some point found redemption and became better. And whatever, you know, it's like the cops didn't know that his kids were in the car. You didn't necessarily check the scene. You didn't know, like, it just seems uncalled for, that's all. And if you had the ability to brawl with them the first time, it seems like non-lethal methods could have been used. And I wonder what would have happened if those cops did not have guns and they just had billy clubs or something like they have in the UK. What I suspect is everybody would have walked out alive, even if, if not Bruce. Let's take a listen to Jacob Blake's sister for a moment. We have this clip. Let's play the clip. I am my brother's keeper. And when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, mm -hmm. make sure you say son, make sure you say uncle, but most importantly, make sure you say human. Human life. Let it marinate in your mouth, in your minds, a human life, just like every single one of y'all and everywhere around school, we're human and his life matters. So many people have reached out to me telling me they're sorry that this happened to my family. Well, don't be sorry because this has been happening to my family for a long time, longer than I can account for. It happened to Emmett Till. Mm. Emmett Till is my family. Mm. Philando, Mike Brown, mm. Sandra. This has been happening to my family. And I've shared tears for every single one of these people that it's happened to. Mm. This is nothing new. I'm not sad. I'm not sorry. I'm angry. Mm. And I'm tired. Mm. I haven't cried one time. I stopped crying years ago. I am numb. I have been watching police murder people that look like me for years. Mm. I'm also a black history minor. Mm. So not only have I been watching it in the 30 years that I've been on this planet, but I've been watching it for years before we were even alive. I'm not sad. I don't want your pity. I want change. You know, if indeed we live in a society with a social contract where life has value, um, the moment that Sean's social contract breaks down where an element of your society no longer believes that they will be protected, no longer believe they can call the cops, no longer can trust how the cops behave towards them or whether they would be honest or not. And for that matter, whether or not something that is a basic call ends up with the loss of a life. Just this year, there have only been 12 days in 2020 where police haven't killed somebody. Police have got 751 people in 235 days. Now, believe it or not, this is on par on average, right? Cops kill over a thousand people a year with 99% of them having no consequences for it. So, you know, I, I feel for, I, I don't, like she said, I am sick of this. I don't want your apologies. I don't want your prayers. I don't want none of that stuff. I just want this to be different and I want this to change. And I think that, feeling that is an honest feeling and i don't necessarily say how you negate that because this is not her asking for something that's dodgy or anything else her thing is i want policy i want 
some change in this that prevents this particular instance from happening in the way that this instance did. And look, whether you're white, black, gay, straight, anywhere in between, um, you see that number of 735 people killed by cops. That number is astonishing. And just think, we still have several more months in the year. We haven't even hit 1,000 yet. We still have more to go. That needs to change. And whether you want to put that blame, however you want to put that blame. I think the point is, that shouldn't happen. You look around the world, that doesn't happen. You could look at the UK, they had what, like five, if they had that much. I'm making a point to you that this is, you're so accustomed to it that some people in your society reflexively, because they're accustomed to it, give the cop a pass if anything went on in that process, even when nothing went on in that process. Hey, that 12 year old really shouldn't have been walking around with that gun like that, even though it was a toy gun. Why not? Does he not have the same rights as other people in your society? What about Trayvon Martin? He wasn't even killed by a cop. The point with Trayvon Martin, though, is your society looked at a murder and gave it a clean shoot bill of health. My point to you is if you're a member of the community in your country and you see how little that life is valued when it's put up against somebody committing a crime, what are you to take from that? And do you take from that that we are not safe in this community? We're not safe in this society. I can get involved in something with a cop that is belligerent, kills me, and I... As I lay there dying, know that the majority of the cops will probably walk. That needs to change. And whether you want to consider that um, a factor of poverty, whether you want to consider that a factor of cop culture, what, whatever. Her point is just it needs to change. And I got to be honest, um, Shane, I feel the same way. And the catch becomes how does that change? What are the mechanisms that need to take place to make that change. And like you said earlier, it's complicated. I mean, you have like 20, you know, multiple items that go into it. The reason I always point to poverty is because that's the key item that I know I can point to that at the very least gives me bang for the buck in regards to, to statistical change in regards to our society. Um, when you hear her say that, what do you think though? I'm curious. I mean, not, and this is not, um, this is a human thing, right? I mean, her point is he's a human being and do human beings have value or not? And if they do, this shouldn't happen. I can't, I can't, you know, disagree with her argumentation. And if it was my family member, I would be far more caustic um, and I would not be the person to come out and say, let's stop the violence. So let's, you know, so I appreciate her, her temperament, her cadence, all that stuff. And I even appreciate her maintaining her resolve of saying, look, this needs to stop. And he's a human being and he needs to be treated as such, not just him, others. How do you view that? Do you view that as belligerent? Do you view that as, okay, that's a fair point? Do you view that as understand where she's coming from? How do you, from your perspective, and I know you have a humanist perspective on things, how do you view that? Uh, so she, uh, for one thing, I'm going to say this, I'm actually going to come back to actually the specific question you asked, which is my take on it, which was a bunch of different stuff happened and then by, you know, I can give my ultimate opinion. But another, just a, real quick, it's interesting to hear her talking. She she's the first, I think, politically conscious sort of, not just politically conscious. How does it? She has a minor as far as she was going for a minor. I forget exactly what she said in Black history, um, and I think she was speaking from that perspective and trying to sum up. I think she did an effective job in a way that I can't remember the family members, the close associates of any other previous uh, black black people doing basically vic victims in in these cases. That seems unique to me. Does that make sense? Just for, just for straight that off the bat, sense. she was speaking from that perspective in a way that I, I just don't remember happening with like Trayvon Martin, for instance, or any 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 of the other previous victims. Yeah, those came across as more pain. Um, like it didn't come across as this kind of politically astute opinion and trying to um, make that it just came across as these people were hurt. That's, you know, so I agree with you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then uh, just to come back to what you were actually asking. She's, she's talking and she's saying stuff. And obviously, you know, we each have our own kind of convoluted to the extent that you're mm, the extent that you're, you're you have to be responsible for your thoughts and for your actions and for your opinions in terms of what you're doing. You said that you've gotten to that point. We're all conscious of this stuff. And, and therefore, if you have a relationship with it, it's going to be kind of a complicated relationship because just like this, whatever your political perspective is, there's so much baggage on either side. Ultimately, for, for you know, I, I listen to her and my my takeaway is. Where, where I settle with it is what can we do is that's the level we're operating on is this countrywide level It's either me, the individual, and maybe my family, or it's 
were, were this larger organism like the country, for instance. Um, and from that perspective, there's, there's something that needs to be done here. Um, and where I was left, where I'm almost always left, sadly, is just trying to figure out what, how to straddle the ground. I don't know. It's, maybe it's my, my, the way that I think about things. But it's like, what is the middle point? What is the crux here? If you're going to bring answer. people together to have a conversation so I think that that's we the move forward. Cause, cause well, and I think the, the reason why you see people protesting like that or pulling out statues or, you know, whatever else. I think, I think what happens is that people feel something bothers them. They realize something is wrong. And their first thought is, okay, what can I do about it? And then they see this large machine of a country, and it's like, I can't do anything about it. And so you end up with that energy being exerted into areas that aren't necessarily entirely productive, even though you can kind of grasp where they come from. Let's take a break, though. You guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We'll be back in a moment. Fault Lines. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. By Any Means Necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us from mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Fault Lines. And you're... We're back. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. I'm joined by my co-host, Jamal Thomas. I am Shane Stranahan, and we are taking your calls, 202-521-1320. Again, I'll, I'll just give you the single numbers, the integers, even, one, one by one, 202-521-1320. Please, give us a call. We're on. Um, we're talking about Kenosha. We're talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about, I, you know, the fundamental issues that uh, I say. Oh, by the, the way, Black Lives say Matter. There. I do want to talk about that. You well, would love this. I think you'd get a kick out of this. What's up? So you saw Joe Biden um, doing his thing where he basically, well, let me say this. You saw the Rahm Emanuel clip where Rahm Emanuel made the point to say, yeah, we got Black Lives Matter under our tent. And, you know, this is always amazing to me. Um, the level, The level of shamelessness, it's almost like a superhuman attribute that politicians have. Rahm Emanuel literally work with the cops in order to bury a video of a child being shot by those cops, dash cam video. And he's saying, we have Black Lives Matter. Joe Biden constructed, he called it the Biden crime bill. And so it's like, if you are Black Lives Matter and you hear Rahm Emanuel say that, would you not bristle at that? If you are Black Lives Matter, you see Joe Biden putting up Flo George Floyd's picture and using this kind of, this kind of, tacit approval of it, despite the fact that he's, like it's approval only in optics. It gives the impression that the president or the person who's running to be president of the United States is working in tandem with this organization. Not only is he the second black president, not only is he <laughs> like bringing along the African-Americans with him that was, uh, he was fighting for the Rialdo movie theater or whatever, not, uh, not, 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 you know, not only of all that, but it now also looks like the protest movement that basically started from the bills and the, the laws that were passed by Democrats, um, that were enacted by Democrats, that now the Democrats can, can basically say, we have Black Lives Matter under our belt. If you, you Shane, if this was you, if you were Black Lives Matter, whoever you were, and I don't, look, I, I think oftentimes when people consider Black Lives Matter, I think they may overdo it in regard to the number of protests. Not every protest is a Black Lives Matter protest, but if you were BLM, and you were sitting at home and you saw that, what would you do? 
Like, what would be your response to that to make it look like the Democratic Party was basically appropriating and working in tandem with you? We do have a caller. We're going to get to you, Rod. Give me one moment. But would, like, wouldn't you respond to that? Like, wouldn't you bristle at that? I mean, even in Politico, Politico wrote an article that basically said that people who were associated with Black Lives Matter called lip service. Well, yeah, it may be lip service, but it's lip service that has the ability to pull in people to make people think that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party is somehow working in tandem with Black Lives Matter. This is why people say movements go to die in the Democratic Party. This is the exact reason. I don't know how I would respond. Um, really? You don't it. think you push back on that? Like don't, You don't think the very next day you'd be screaming to the hill, that's not true? It depends on who I am, because I, you know, I mean, plenty of plenty of plenty of BLM protesters out there aren't just Democrats. You know, they're just they're just party Democrats, as far as I can tell. Not most of them. I'm just I'm not trying to characterize characterize, them, but I'm just saying, if you were to statistically choose somebody, I don't I don't know where I would fall on that. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I I imagine, but I tend not to. I've never bought into one of these parties, and I've never really felt like they've tried to co-op me, mainly because I haven't had a political identity that they could co-op. I, you know. I have my own weird political issues, so it's just completely outside of my bailiwick in a weird way. Um, you done to go to calls? We've got Lou, actually. Not not Rod first. We'll get to you in a second, Rod. But we've got Lou it's calling. It's Lou from Missouri sure. first. Lou from Missouri, what's going on? Not much. Well, I was calling because yesterday uh, you all touched on the AI symbiosis, uh, and it kind of the the things that always that always troubled me about the thought of AI is, is uh, you know, are we just creating a new permanent underclass? You know, now that we're done oppressing humans, let's kick it over to the AI. Uh, and um, I would also be worried about, you know, if you have a neural link, is that something that could be hacked by somebody by a third party? And, you know, you have someone essentially hacking your senses uh, and augmenting your reality. And I had a question about just AI in general, just like a philosophical question for the two of you. Um, if we do, you know, categorize AI as a life form because it's sentient, and that AI finds itself into an android hole with a with an artificial womb, and that android finds a little bit of man to pay the child that doesn't work out. Would you say that they should have any type of parental rights or be a type of custody? Uh, and um, also just about <clears throat> excuse me in terms of Black Lives Matter protesting and everything like that, and um, wondering what should be done. The streets have been talking for generations and saying what needs to be done. It's just people don't want to listen and actually do it. It's just people who are, you know, most people, most people just want to know what can be done in a way that I'm comfortable with and used to or have a frame of reference for. But people have been saying for generations, okay, reallocate these walls, stop occupying, stop being an occupying force in our neighborhood, you know, actually build community relations. And they just say, uh, no, we're going to keep beating the shit out of you guys. <laughs> I don't understand where all the confusion is with what to do to move forward. Uh, we need to route out these racists out of the Has anybody ever watched a uh, case? But wait, Lou, real quick. How do you do that? Like, my argument is this is not a bad apple. It's the majority of the cop culture. Oh, it's, it's Every fun. so often, I think you may find a good one, but I think the majority, I think that's just cop culture. It's like, so how do you root that out of cop culture? It's already the the programs of, of changing their behavior don't work, getting them to play with cats, that's not doing it, giving them dogs to keep them calm, that doesn't do it. So it becomes this thing of like, all right, well, you need to get rid of or change policing as we know it. Yeah. Maybe that's the way to think of it. In and of it yeah, the institution in and of itself either needs to go or be fundamentally re uh, reworked to where the powers that they are afforded in our society are completely just changed. Because as it stands, they have carte blanche to be judge, jury, and executioner on the spot. I agree. Think, Lou, I think, thank you for the call. We, Lou, Let's we, go we, to we've the got next to go. One. We've got a bunch of other callers. I mean, I agree with that. Institutionally, there, there's a bunch of room to rethink stuff. I just think it's a matter of timing and actually doing that work, actually rethinking the institutions, coming up with a number of plans. Two other things I wanted to come back to. Again, we've got other callers. You said AI uh, may become a permanent underclass under people, under humans. Of course, another alternative there is that we would become a permanent underclass under AI or under some people who wield AI. Then another thought there is that we'll unify with AI in some way. That's actually, again, what, what Musk seems to be pushing for with Neuralink. And then to be honest, these conversations about AI are fascinating to me. Do you know they just found 50 new planets yeah. using AI? They had a breakthrough yeah. in AI and astrology. I mean, oh, and, um, oh. Yeah. Like, so, and, and keep in mind, AI doesn't necessarily mean that these things are thinking. It just means that the technology has gotten so complex that they have, all, you know, it's not the computer sentient. 
Now, if it gets to the point where we find some level where it's like, okay, is this thing sentient or not? Then that's a whole different question of or underclass and everything that's, else. And All that's, those that's, conversations that's are fascinating. Turing test aspect. Yeah, there's a Turing test aspect there where you'd have to find out. But you also, what's the baseline? You can't tell sentient or conscious versus not. One tiny quick comment, not just Neuralink though, but deep fakes, VR, everything getting virtualized. That's the real threat. If you're wanting, if you're worrying about rewriting reality, not being able to verify truth. If you combine fake news with baked media, again, deep fakes with audio, video, everything. Um, that's where it gets really worrying. Anyway, we've got other callers. We've got Rod calling in from Philly. Let's get to Rod. Rod, you're on. What's going on? Hey, good, good morning, guys. Um, we had a, a pretty interesting guest on with uh, Dr. Corgan um, last hour, and uh, had a lot of good things to say. And he as a doctor and, and uh, going on with COVID-19. But uh, I want to talk I want to uh, talk about something that he didn't really talk about and a lot of people haven't really uh, honed in on. And uh, you kind of talked about this on Thursday, Shane, when uh, we talked about uh, Putin's opponent, uh, Alexei Navalny, I believe his name is, who got poisoned on the plane and passed out, put in the hospital, and now he's on a ventilator. That's what's keeping him alive. And the question that people haven't been asking and put out to the medical community is what is the reasoning for putting patients who are tested positive or assumed, presumed to be uh, COVID on ventilators? Hasn't been, hasn't been asked, hasn't been really spoken about. Uh, NPR put out an article in early April that most patients put on ventilators die. And most of the people, most patients put on ventilators can't be taken off. Because you've already you've weakened their respiratory system. They are now uh, the machines breathing for them. Their body doesn't not want to breathe for itself anymore. So um, yeah, we should <laughs> run. No, that's that's a good question. That's a good point, and we should get them on. That's a, that's a good question for us. Yeah, to that's ask. a medical question. I don't know how to answer that one. I've been on a ventilator before. Yeah, um, they took me off, but I would imagine most people were on it as end of life. So I would, yeah, so it would make yeah. sense that most of those people would die more, though, you know, I, otherwise I don't think they would put them on it. But I don't know the answer to why they put COVID Tomorrow, Maybe we on should it. talk about that. Maybe maybe at 9.15 or something like that, I'll, I'll bring that. I'm actually curious to hear about your experience. But we've got more callers we should go to now while we've still got time. Um, Centurion calling in from Missouri. Centurion, you're on the line. What's going on? Well, I want to make a statement that uh, what happened on the East Coast of this country around 1776 is the biggest event in the past 10,000 years. Nothing stands above it. Nothing stands next to it, and everything else is below it. And the United States empire is not weak, delicate, or fragile. And I'm talking to Black Lives Matter and Antifa, which I'm going to call Clan Tifa. You're going to lose. You're not going to win. We're going to look back from 2030 and see how you lost. Because you now, Centurion, real quick, don't go anywhere. Burn um, your own wait, wait, Centurion, what do you okay. consider a loss for either Antifa or BLM? I'm curious. Well, they have burned their own towns, okay? They're not soldiers. They want to pretend like they're soldiers. No, negative, negative. They, soldiers protect their homeland. These people have burned their own neighborhoods, and we've seen it again last night. And I'm, I'm telling you guys, and everybody that's in that Black Lives Matter and Clan Tifa, don't look for war, because you may not like what you find. Now, one You're more thing, Centurion. Right Centurion, wait, 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 real quick. Is it possible? To any degree that's possible, that they don't want to be out there protesting, but they're protesting something that they consider an injustice, whether that's now or whether that's, look, I'm telling you, man, it's not just Antifa and Black Lives Matter. You realize you many of the people who are protesting matter. aren't Black Lives Matter. Many of those people are white, and they're the, not Antifa. The and you have a majority of the country that has started to agree and say, yeah, there's something the wrong with this. There's something wrong with the way we've been acting in our society. If the majority of your society, let's say not liking the riot, and I even agree with you to the point that you shouldn't burn down your own community. Fair enough. Um, but how are they going to lose if the society at this point has started to agree, at the very least, that something needs to change in the tenor towards the way we do civil rights? 30 seconds, because we have one more caller. Missouri, two weekends ago, two weekends ago, we had six murders in 24 hours. It was all black on black crime. Now, I've called before and, and wanted you guys to talk about it. I'm not describing African-American descent. You know, I'm not saying that these people are just all of them are evil. I have black friends. I have family that are African-Americans. My nephew married people. You know, this, this is ridiculous to say that 
every other white person that the Republicans are racist. That's wrong. Um, I never said that, by the way. I don't think, I don't think I we're saying that. I don't think I've never said that. Saying you might have you you heard that from some of the guests. And said yeah, I've well, never said that. In fact, fact I've always pushed back on that argument because I don't think the majority fight. of the, the Republicans are racist. But, but we have one. We, we, I don't know if we're going to have time. Um, 45 um, seconds. Yeah, break. let's take Mike real quick in the next segment. Yeah. So let's go to a break. You guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We'll be back in a moment. Centurion, thank you for your call. Fault lines. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. What's the most important hour of the day? It's the critical hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon. On this show, we don't just deliver the latest headlines. We divide the real from the fake. Tune in to hear from some of the most brilliant political minds of today. Get in-depth news and analysis that goes beyond the surface and dig straight into the details. Set your clock to the critical hour for a news perspective unlike any of those other guys. Tune in to the critical hour with Dr. Wilmer Leon, weekdays 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, and catch us on Facebook Live. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Welcome back to Fault Lines on Radio Sputnik. My name is Jamal Thomas. I'm joined by my co-host, Shane Stranahan, coming to you from the capital of the world, Washington, D.C. Uh, we have a, well, Before we get to our guests, let's go to Silver Springs. It's in our hometown. And we have Mike. Mike, what's going on? Let's try to keep it to about 30 seconds, though, Mike. Okay, the last caller made some valid points, and I think that we should, you know, his points are equally as valid. My uh, question, just to sum it up real quick, is like, how can we, we, I think we need to gauge our expectations of what the United States is. Uh, they're too high. Like, the question is like, okay, we're the foremost authority, we have all this power. Where do we get it from? We've only been around for 300 years. We haven't been exporting many resources. And then if we owe China, if China, we owe China trillions of dollars, and how is China more economically advanced than us when they have many, much more people? That's my question, and that's my comment. Thank you, Mike. Let's get to that question at the end of the break. So let's bring in the break, um, I guess, first, and then let's talk about that at the 9 o'clock break. Um, with us, we have a great guest for the next hour. Joining us is attorney, political activist, former member of both the Louisiana State and Louisiana House of Representatives, Elbert Guillory. Welcome to the show, um, Elbert. How are you doing today? Very fine. Good to be here with you, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, and we are glad to have you. And so we have brought you on to have a discussion on the Kenosha riots. And, well, well, both, the Kenosha riots and the um, RNC convention. From your point of view, have you seen the events that have taken place? And i got to be honest, let's put a larger context to it. Not just Wisconsin, but all of it over the course of the year in the United States. The 755 people that were shot, whether they were white, black, gay, straight, whatever else. And you get to protests that are taking place in Portland. You get all the protests that happened after um, George Floyd. And whatever I think of the defund the police argument, I think that argument is problematic. I think it needs to be done a different way. I do understand the reasoning and the rationale for pushing a provocative statement like that in order to try to get attention and to try to get change. Um, we had a case where Jacob is going to be paralyzed. Um, and you have a public that responded to that almost at this point is zero tolerance. This belief that the social fabric is for the most part broken down in regards to defending and protecting people of color. Um, and you have protests and riots. I mean, honest to God, riots in real terms. I mean, they're setting cars on fire and whatnot. And then you had a militia that came in and started shooting protesters. What do you, how do you frame this? Like, how do you process as a person who was in Congress, who was in the political space, who a person who was um, an activist, and you're seeing what looks just like chaos. What is your point of view, and how do you frame what's taking place right now in Wisconsin? You know, I'm a veteran of 
the protests of the 1950s and 1960s, <clears throat> there's a big difference between a protest and a riot. There's a big difference between peacefully making a point and breaking into stores and stealing stuff. Um, I am 1,000% in favor of peaceful protest. I am totally against the lawlessness, the looting, the burning, the arsoning, uh, the stopping people, rights to travel on highways, uh, pulling people out of cars, kicking them until they are uh, unconscious. That lawlessness should have been stopped. The only reason it hasn't is because too many of our politicians are gutless wimps who refuse to enforce the law, protecting uh, people's lives and people's property. I really believe that, that they're gutless wimps. Like, let me ask you this. What do you mean by, let me say two things. One, I agree with you. I don't like riots. Um, by the same token, it's, it's, I look, I have a weird contradiction with this, right? In my head, I don't like the riots. I don't like people being injured. Many of those people, some of those people have no idea even what took place. And you have some people who are getting injured or like you said, the car parks being burned and torched. Um, by the same token, I do understand this notion that my pain or whatever we consider to be pain, we don't want it to be isolated to us. If we're sitting in the corner with a hurt arm, you can ignore us. If we hit somebody else, somebody else can get acknowledgement. Or do you think it's not even that thought out? It's just anger, hurt, pain that is expressed in this very specific way that is not necessarily entirely thought out as a political action, like you were talking about in the 1960s, but is more so a response to what they believe is taking place around them. I mean, I understand what you mean. Um, yeah, I understand what you mean, but I mean, you do get that this didn't happen out of nowhere. Like that extremes to some degree produce extremes. And cops killing a thousand people a year is insane. But in this very specific situation where you can watch the video, you can come honestly to the conclusion that that shouldn't have happened. Now, people who came to that conclusion, you can justify, you could say, you're right, that that doesn't justify injuring, killing, kicking, beating somebody else. Fair enough. Um, by the same token, when there is what seems to be from a group of people within the context of the society, no answer, no viable response, and something that continuously keeps happening. Isn't it a rational action to have some level of anger and rage? Whether you like it or not, I don't like rioting either. I guess I'm making the point that if it comes across from an aspect of your society, a percentage of your society, that for whatever reason, they are not protected in the same way that other people are protected. Isn't it somewhat of a rational act to lash out whether or not it's good or bad or even productive. Part of the problem that we have is that in more than 95% of the police shootings, <clears throat> those shootings start with, or they, they get into a, a, onto a bad road with someone who is disobeying a lawful police order. In the case, case of Jacob Blake, we don't know exactly what happened. The video shows the shooting, but it doesn't show what took place prior to the shooting. We know that- Mr. Well, well, wait, just be real quick. If I'm not mistaken, a, another video was released that showed a scuffle that was going on. And he extricated himself from the scuffle and apparently tried to get to his car. Um, look, I agree with you. When I watch these videos, I, I cringe. With the moment when a shooting takes place, and let's say it's an African American. And again, I don't know. Look, 1,000 shootings a year. Blacks make up 13% of the country. That means a lot of those other people who are shooting are not black. So let's put that in context first. On the other part, a lot of these people being shot in the back. If there's a scuffle, I agree with you, man. I look at that and I say, don't do that. Because I bristle, because I thought my first thought is, oh my God, they're going to have maximum justice. And you're going to have a lot of people in the society that said, clean murder. 
And so I don't want that. So I agree with you. But despite that, doesn't life to some degree have value? And if life does indeed have value, shouldn't that cop have a responsibility, if not philo philosophical, to ensure that all the other avenues are explored before going to the avenue of maximum justice? And from the video that you watch, is it fair that a section of the population says other avenues could have been explored? The bottom line is that 90%, more than 95 actually percent of all of these incidents, whether you're talking about Michael Brown or the guy in New York selling the, the <clears throat> loose cigarettes, they all begin with someone disobeying a lawful order. Same thing that happened with, uh, with Floyd. He would be alive today if he had simply cooperated with the cops. But, um, but Elbert, I mean, come on. You can't honestly say that a person disobeying a cop justifies death. You can't say that. Michael no. Brown, in that video, he might have had those little cigarettes, doesn't... but what that cop did was against the law. No, that chokehold was illegal. That cop was not prosecuted. No, I don't feel like Elbert's gotten a chance to... Oh, I'm sorry. Chance. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, yeah. I'm just... He's making a basic argument that basically says, look, if they would have responded or acted... I don't, I don't think you've heard it. I don't think you've I'm heard it. I'm sorry, Elbert. I'm sorry. Honestly, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, my, my point is, is not that, that someone should be killed for disobeying a cop. What I'm saying is that if you set into motion a series of acts that ends with your death, then you should take some responsibility for not setting those conditions, those circumstances into motion. Too many people set those into motion. Challenge the police in court. Don't challenge the police on the street. If this man was doing, he was tased. Mr. Blake was tased before he was shot. He had to have done something. People are just, go, police don't go around tasing people for, for playing tiddlywinks. He was tased for some reason. He was doing something. He was violating some law. And when the cops told him to stand down and to submit to arrest, he apparently chose to, to, to flee or to do something else. And so he has to have, has to take some responsibility for his own condition. We need to, as a nation, we need to teach children in schools, in churches, in community action organizations to obey police on the streets. If you think that the police are wrong, challenge them in the courts. But if you don't teach your kids to obey the cops and to respect authority on the streets, too often they're going to wind up dead. And that is the problem. And then folks get mad and want to burn down the doggone country. That's not fair. It's not right. Elbert, I think the issue here, I can agree with you, at least on the point that it is probably better for your life and limb to challenge the stuff in court. But I don't agree with you on is that disobeying a cop justifies the murder of an individual if there are other avenues that could be explored that could take that person in. I mean, for God's sake, it's as if the argument that you're making is basically that the cop has no agency. I don't think, but I don't think he was making that argument. I, I just I heard him, Shane. I heard you. He's saying that there needs to be responsibility well, I mean, for the person involved. And I agree. I, you've heard me on multiple occasions bristle at, I'm like, God, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. For the very reason that Elbert is saying. So fair enough. I'm not taking anything away from the argument that, that there's culpability. Isn't that sides, though? It, like, isn't that, again, if, isn't that responsibility falling on both sides of the, the moral calculus here? Isn't that the, the cops should, should, should not have escalated in that way? They should have handled it more responsibly. They should have done anything they can. We should have a culture that tries to minimize the use of force unless when absolutely necessary. And we should obviously try to reduce the, you know, when it's necessary. But then on the other hand, he's saying people should take more responsibility for getting into these things and for, for not disobeying, not disobeying the police. I don't know. I, I, my point is, I didn't hear him making the argument you seem to be saying he was making, which is that it justifies the murder of people or it justifies the killing of people. I don't think he was saying that. If I ask. Not at all. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Albert. I'm sorry. No, no, go right ahead. I was just going to say, look, if we're having a conversation about cops killings and I say I agree with you that I think it's problematic 
when a person um, gets into this kind of escalation with a cop. Because at the end of the day, that escalation ends with your death. I'm saying that should be unacceptable if there are other ways of doing it. Now, you could say that the person should take more responsibility. I don't know what that means in real terms. Okay. Um, I would say that, I would say that, look, regardless of what the altercation is between you and the cop, if there is a chance to take that person in alive, then they should do so. And there should be a legal responsibility of that cop to do just that, not acquiescing to the stuff of maximum justice is warranted because a person mouthed off to the policeman. But look, let's take, the, let's bring this back. We have a, um, um, Elbert Guillory, political activist, former member of the Louisiana State Senate and Louisiana House of Representatives, and a great person to argue with on this very specific topic. I like this conversation. So we'll be back in a moment. You guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We'll be back with Elbert Guillory in a moment. Fault Lines. Tough questions are the most powerful weapon we have. As long as you have questions, we'll keep asking. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money related on Sputnik. It's called double down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Are you bored? Are you lonely? Do you need a hug? Well, we can't give you that, but we can keep you up to date on Radio Sputnik. Fault Lines. And we're back. And you're listening to us for Fault Lines with Merle Thomas and Shane Stranahan and Albert Guillory, who's joining us for this segment, continuing a conversation we opened up in the last. We were talking about the Kenosha riots, uh, the killing of Jacob Blake. We're actually going to move to the RNC. Maybe we can come back to that first one. But we're going to talk about Republican National Convention. Started yesterday. Um, uh, pardon me. Started on Monday. Second day last night. And it's going through until Thursday. Uh, Albert. Looking at the RNC, comparing it to the DNC, what, what's your take on the Trump administration? Where do you see uh, the, the political balance in the United States right now between the Democrats and the Republicans in terms of maturity, electability, how they handle the conventions, their approaches going into the 2020 election? Just what, what's your take on this stuff, uh, Albert? As an old Democrat, <clears throat> uh, former Democrat, I was disappointed with the uh, the Democrat convention. There was too much hate America, too much hate Trump. There was no plan, there was no platform, no discussion of, of America's future and, and where we need to go and how we need to get there. I was, I was disappointed. Totally agree. Not the hate America stuff, but the everything else. Totally agree with you, Albert. I what did you think about the RNC convention? Well, so far, I've, I've enjoyed it. The uh, emphasis on American opportunity is something that really touches my heart. My grandfather was born a slave and in two generations because of our commitment to American opportunity and to the values of this country. I mean education, and hard work. Uh, in two generations, we went from, from slavery to teaching at one of, uh, to having a law professor at one of uh, America's uh, Ivy League law schools and having a, a medical professor at one of America's best medical schools. I mean, to, to accomplish that in two generations uh, requires a great nation, and that's what America is. Actually, was, not so much a great nation, more so a great person, right? I mean, ultimately, your family did exceptionally well, but that's not necessarily preponderance of America. I mean, if you're getting into redlining, you're getting into blocking people from certain jobs, that's going all the way up to like the 80s. And so I, 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 I look, let me say it this way. 
I did a, a monologue the other day where I was talking about the DNC convention. And I think I probably described it exactly the way that you described it, maybe with mine is the Mahita America. Um, look, what I, let, me, let me say it this way. What I'm looking for, or what I was wanted in the conventions, both, is what I thought was philosophical, philosophically responsible, meaning from the standpoint of those candidates and from the standpoint of the parties, especially in the context of their job and responsibility for America itself. This country has fallen off of its axis. And instead of hearing, look, we have 30 million people out of a job, let's hear, this is what we're gonna do about it. We have 20 something million people without healthcare, this is what we're gonna do about it. We have all of these stores that have closed. I didn't hear that in either convention. I heard one convention that focused entirely on Trump and acted as America was an afterthought. And I heard the other convention um, that basically talked about Joe Biden as if he was Bernie Sanders. Did it bother you to any degree that it didn't seem like the Republican Party or the people who were speaking at the Republican convention could deal with Biden as Biden as opposed to him being dealt with as if he was AOC? Yes. One of the things that I liked, particularly at the RNC, uh, was the Senator Tim Scott's discussion. I mean, we were just talking about American opportunity. But the, uh, to, 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 to juxtapose that to young Mr. Sandman, the teenager who was accosted by the old Native Americans uh, who beat the drum in his face and did all that stuff, and to, to look at, to expose the fake news, the false media, the get Trump attitude of the news media, uh, and to, to, to listen to him talk about the couple of hundred million dollars that he has won in courts because of the uh, slander. I mean, that was just, that was, that, was America, that was America at its best. I loved it. America at its best? A Native American was protesting. Now, that group has basically been wiped away in a genocide of the nation that you are saying, the, you know, the, the great nation of the United States. Um, and this guy was had a Make America Great hat on. And look, he, he might have won in court, fair enough. And I know the media at that point went bananas, but I, I agree with you, even at that point, media has a tendency towards fakeness. And our media has decided that it hates Trump. So when the RNC convention is taking place, MSNBC and CNN are basically saying things with a level of hypocrisy that is profound and astonishing. But I don't know how a Native American being faced down, um, who has every right in the world to protest, was not being violent, was not attacking anybody else, and was getting leered down by a guy in a Trump hat. I don't know how that's, like, look, I don't know how that's a great instance of America. Um, and I guess, I, I, don't, I guess the disconnect that I'm having here is that I agree with you with the Democrat part that says, look, these guys were out of touch. I don't agree with your Republican part because I don't know or I don't see. I don't have the vantage point. I'm not a Democrat. I don't like, you know, I, I, I probably get along better with Trumpers, maybe even the Democrats. They, they aggravate me. But I don't see how you can look at their convention and come away with one assessment and then look at the RNC convention and come away with another assessment that almost gives them a pass on dealing with the real material concerns of America, and America that honestly has fallen off of this axis. I mean, 170,000 people are dead. You're gonna talk about like 300,000 people that are gonna be dead as a result of the actions of, yeah, the R uh, Republican Party. They are the ones that empower, you could say Democrats too. But the RNC, in the same way that the Democratic Party was out of touch at that convention, it came across to me that they were very similar. And I have to be honest, I love this conversation, but you did not answer my question about Joe Biden. Meaning all of those people say he's empty headed and everything else. They attacked him relentlessly, fair enough, but they attacked him not for who Joe Biden was, which you could have done. They attacked him basically as a straw man for who he wasn't. I'm asking you, is that, is that really the campaign that you want to run for all of the opportunity and everything else? I, I agree with you. But is that the campaign that you really want to run, pretending that Joe Biden is basically somebody he is not in a way of trying to win this contest? Well, let's, let's talk about who Joe Biden really is. Number one, 
he is a corrupt politician, corrupt career politician. He's been there for half century. And during that time, he has, through his self-aggrandizing deals, Ukraine being one perfect example, he's made himself and his family multimillionaires. Number two, he's senile and he's demented. He gives old people a bad name. Number three, he a, a vote for, for Biden is really a vote for Kamala for president or for somebody else because you, you, no one believes that he will make it four years. His number four, his background is truly racist. He's been big buddies with the head of the, the KKK. He, uh, he didn't want to send his kids to school because black kids uh, with black kids because it would be a racial dr- jungle. Uh, black people are not diverse like Hispanics. If you don't vote for me, you're not black. I mean, this is a bozo who deserves a kick in the pants instead of a seat in the White House. Thousand percent agree. I even agree that the civil rights thing. Now, you say you're part of the civil rights movement. I one of the things that bothered me probably more about Joe Biden than maybe anything else outside maybe the crime bill was the lying about civil rights. Um, I consider the civil rights movement sacred. And I suspect a lot of African Americans do, especially when they were participated in it. Um, for Joe Biden to come out and look one black face in the eye and say, I was a part of the movement that helped basically liberate this country. And he would go from church to church to church, missing the point that back in the 80s, Joe Biden dropped out of the race and admitted, I was not part of the civil rights movement. I was some um, white kid in Delaware that blah, 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 blah. How did that make you feel? Like when you, you know, regardless of your political tenor, um, as an African-American, and like you said, as part of the civil rights movement, how did you feel about him doing that and media not bringing it up? even though they knew it was a lie. I knew that the uh, the media would give Biden a pass on everything that he does because they are complicit and, and corrupt equally. Uh, I, I was very disappointed that Biden has been given, based on, on race, his, his racism alone. I mean, this man has a history of absolute faux pas on race, and no one calls him a racist. Uh, Donald Trump, on the other hand, has a history of of racial fairness, racial friendships, and everyone wants to call him a racist. I can't believe it. It's I'm, I'm, I'm seeing something that just does not make any sense at all. Come on. Donald Trump broke down an escalator on his announcement speech and said Mexicans were rapists and drug dealers. He has been going around screaming about a quote-unquote China virus. Um, I don't know this <laughs> this magnanimous <laughs> non- <laughs> president that you're, you're speaking of, but I do think it's a fair point to say that Biden is getting a, getting a pass on this. And, you know, Biden... Of all the candidates, Biden has said probably the most racist thing I've ever heard in my life. He got on stage and said black folks can't raise their kids. And when Zerlina Maxwell, Democrat, immediately after when he went to break, she flipped out. She was like, what? I can't believe he said that. That's that's profoundly, whole. you know, he has to drop out. What well, the other guy said, he has to drop out the race. The white announcer came back and said, yeah, but he said it so fast that nobody probably really understood it. She was like, well, who cares if they entirely got what he said? He said it. So I think that's a fair point. I guess my problem in this interview is that you seem to give a soft eye to Republicans and Trump when they do and say stuff or behave in certain ways, or for that matter, even abdicate all responsibility in dealing with the fact that the world has fallen off its axis. By the same token, being very astute in your appraisal of Joe Biden. Now, (laughs) is, is that like... Am I wrong in saying that? Like, is that point of view valid at all? That it does seem like you're giving Donald Trump and the Republican Party and the Republican National Committee uh, Convention, especially a convention, with all of these things that are availing the world, didn't seem to touch on any of them. That doesn't bother you? Like, don't you want the party to which you ascribe to to actually try to deal with the material concerns of your nation, whether they're black, white, gay, straight, Democrat, or for that matter, Republican? 
I think that you're not being told. Let's wrap in 30 seconds. Uh, in your assessment of Trump. Trump didn't say that Mexicans were rapists and, and crooks. He was talking about MS-13. If you go back and, and, and look at what uh, what he said when he came down that escalator. Uh, number two, you're talking about the number of deaths that are taking place in the United States. And you're attributing that to the Republican brother. The, the deaths are coming from a coronavirus. Now, the Republicans just happen to have been sitting in the White House uh, and in, in the, the Senate. Albert, I'm sorry, we've got to go. Thank you so much for joining us. That was the voice of Albert Guillory, attorney, political activist, and former member of both the Louisiana State Senate and Louisiana House of Representatives. We'll be back in a minute. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. Listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Fault lines. And we're back live, coming to you from across the divided states of America. It is time for the last hour this morning, this Wednesday morning of the most disruptive show in the states of America, in the politically independent corner, and on the west coast of those states. I am Jane Stranahan, your investigative political analyst and radio talk show host. And in the left corner, I am the indefatigable, ever vigilant, the last man on the wall with my co-host, Shane Stranahan, your political analyst, Jamal Thomas. Building that wall up, maybe even expanding it into a castle, a fort, we'll start with the fort, we are Fault Line with Thomas and Stranahan. And together we bring you the news three times each morning, one at 7, one at 8, and one at 9 a.m. Eastern. Those, of course, those times are 4, 5, and 6 uh, a.m. Pacific. That's where I am. And we're going into our third round, our last round of headlines. Jacob Blake's family updated the public on his condition yesterday, indicating that he was paralyzed from the waist down. Doctors said possibly for life. It is reported that when he woke upon learning of the paralysis, he cried, saying, I am sorry. This uh, follows two more killed. Uh, this came around the same time. Two more were killed and more were wounded in Kenosha, Wisconsin, as a militia descended on the city to protect businesses after a shooting in Kenosha on Sunday night led to more protests. Man who was shot, Jacob Blake, again, said to be in stable condition. Uh, but, uh, but we'll see where these things go. We just had a segment with this, with Albert Guillory talking with this in the first segment uh, at about 8.30. If you go back half an hour ago at this point, you can listen to that interesting conversation back and forth. Uh, very happy to have him on, and we'd love to have him on uh, again soon. Anyway, next headline. As we also talked about just a couple minutes ago, yesterday was RNC Day 2. Last night was Night 2 with Eric Trump, Tiffany Trump, and Melania Trump each giving speeches Again, more of Trump's family giving speeches. That is a theme at the RNC this year. Pompeo gave an address from Israel. Rep. Joaquin Castro, this is a Texas Democrat, vice chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, said that he would investigate whether Pompeo's address violates State Department policies and the Federal Hatch Act, which prohibits federal officials from engaging in political activity in their official capacity. By the way, that's the same Hatch Act that also may restrict Trump from giving a speech on the White House South Lawn this Thursday. Also at the RNC, Angel Mom, that's Mary Ann Mendoza, uh, got pulled from the RNC after spreading a QAnon post that apparently incorporated anti-Semitic messaging. She said that she had not read that far. She had not read that part of the thread that she retweeted or uh, what she had reposted. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, she got pulled, I'm guessing, because of that. That's what people were associating with it after all. Hurricane Laura may become a Category 3 hurricane as it makes landfall. 600,000 were ordered to evacuate. Storm surge warning is in place across much of Louisiana's coastline, also hits part of East Texas's coastline. Parts of eastern Houston are in the crossfires there. Again, evacuations in the area, storm surge warnings. Uh, Hurricane Laura seems to be picking up what Marco left behind. Hurricane Laura definitely seems to uh, ready to hit harder than Marco did, coming just a few days later. China has claimed, by the way, that a U.S. spy plane entered a no-fly zone in the Pacific yesterday. They criticized this. It's unclear exactly where the spy plane flew, uh, but it seems like 
somewhere near the South China Sea. Just put it as a pretty broad, broad area, but it seems to be an ocean flyover. Uh, again, big area of territorial contestation between the two countries. And our next headline, Jerry, Jerry Falwell Jr., son of uh, Jerry Falwell Sr., almost by definition there, um, both uh, Christian evangelists. Uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. is resigning from Liberty University after all. He's taking home a $10.5 million payout. This comes after accusations of an affair by former pool boy John Carlo Granda, who had accused Falwell and his wife of engaging in a years-long affair uh, with them. Not with him. Granda had been accusing him of basically sitting there watching, sort of like the voyeuristic thing. Um, anyway, a cuckoldry thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> John Carlo Granda was apparently, that was... Jerry Fall, oh man, I, I lost myself. Jerry Fall, what, I don't mean to laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Of accusation. Yeah, no, that, that totally cleared my mind. Jerry Falwell Jr. came out and then said that Jen Carlo Grande had gotten into an affair with his wife, but that he was then extorting her. He was extorting the couple after, you know, with blackmail, basically, um, after after getting into the affair. Anyway, Jerry Falwell Jr., after getting into some back and forth with Liberty University, has resigned. That's the headline. Next headline 54% of San Francisco storefronts <clears throat> pardon, are no longer in business. 1,200 stores uh, still still uh, still open after about 1,300 have closed. City's unemployment numbers are also high, with claims reaching 193,000 in that city. That is four times the number of claims filed in 2008 during the Great Recession. Across the country, over in New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio said that indoor dining may not return until after the arrival of a vaccine. That is likely due early next year. That leaves many restaurant owners in the city wondering, what the heck are they going to do? Should they close down their uh, stores now? Are they, you know, they sh should they shutter them? Is it time? Um, sadly, probably is for many. We'll see, though. Uh, yeah, huge, huge, huge economic consequences. We have no idea what this is going to look like. I don't think anybody in the history of humankind has lived through this specific kind of mass mass shock to the economic system. Global, global lockdowns, almost global. Anyway, California's fires. Started by lightning in uh, Napa Valley, also fires in other parts of the state. California's fires are now affecting air quality as far away as parts of Colorado and Kansas. Again, middle America, that's a long way. Many, many hundreds, even thousands of miles at that point. Next headline, CDC has warned, the CDC has warned that retail and service workers should not argue with anti-maskers, specifically warning that they could be threatened or assaulted for trying to enforce the wearing of masks. This comes after a few incidents in recent months. Uh, where servers specifically at restaurants had tried to get people to wear masks and had been assaulted by them. So it was like a 17-year-old teen was assaulted. He was working at a server at a restaurant. And then an 18-year-old guy who was working at a, an amusement park, I believe, concession stand, something like this, uh, was assaulted as well. So yeah, official recommendation from the CDC does not look good for anti-maskers, but it also just doesn't, it doesn't look good for America. Um, some might say it doesn't look good for the CDC either, but hey. Next headline, just hours after the first confirmed case of reinfection was identified in Hong Kong, researchers reported a woman in Belgium had caught the virus a second time, so that's a second case of reinfection. Soon after, researchers in the Netherlands had given their confirmation of another man being reinfected. So we now have three confirmed cases of reinfection. That, of course, simply establishes that reinfection is possible. It is, of course, still up in the air, though, uh, how prevalent it is, how many people should fear reinfection if symptoms uh, would be possible, which would be worse, how that would work, how long it would take, all those questions are still unanswered. But maybe we'll be able to answer them in future headlines. For today, though, those are the headlines. Those are our top stories. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. All right, and we are back into it, and we're taking calls, 202-521-1320. There were a few issues that we wanted to come back to uh, during during the segment tomorrow. But I'm drawing a I'm drawing a blank, man. I should have been taking notes or something. Thankfully, at least well, one no, of those a few was, was a caller that we, we right at the end. I believe it was well, Mike in Silver Spring yeah. brought up something. Oh, that's I what it was. Right, Mike in Silver Spring. To call back in. I would I would take that call. Yeah, I would take that call again too. That was a good or, call, or, and we didn't get a time yeah. to go, earnestly go like go through it and, and talk about it. And I thought it was a good conversation. Um, yeah, there were a few things. I mean, there was the AI talking about the permanent underclass. You know, that's always going to you know. Uh, um, that to, to peak my interest, and and you know that one gets fascinating on so many levels. I think when um, if we lived in a world where it wasn't this impetus of profit, 
whatever that is. You know, that could be profit in regards to power. That could be profit in regards to just cash or whatever else. Um, and we didn't have this 1% with this notion of what else can we do to maximize our profit? And not even just 1%. I mean, we're just, just uber rich and people who are, are trying to make it, um, make it more. I don't think the AI stuff would be as big of a deal. Because under those circumstances, the artificial intelligence is not working with the sake of trying to get over on somebody or to kill somebody or to make a profit on somebody. It's human interest. What is the best interest of humanity and how does AI assist that? Those are different communities. Those are different worlds. I think what we have is a world where the AI could either get people out of a job or in a weird quirk of things, I don't think we would give them intelligence, but if he did give them intelligence, yeah, he's right. You, you, like a slave class. I mean, the Star Trek... Um, with, with this, with the notion of data, and if you could reproduce data, and you have a thousand datas, and you have basically these guys just doing the mines and the cleaning the warp coils, and, and it becomes, well, wait a minute, is that a slave class at that point? Then the argument and the fight is going to come in on whether it's alive or whether it's not. Um, but let's remove from that one. That's sci-fi-ish. But if you get into this notion of AI and jobs, where that AI starts to do jobs that other people were doing before, well, what happens to the other people? And what are the jobs that they're going to have available for them? And when you get to the point where you have certain people that are just bled out of your society in regards to economic input, and then what does it mean for those people? Is there a universal basic income? And at that point, is the UBI just a bribe because they don't have control or power within regards to the political and economic space? So they're given this money so they could just live a basic existence? And is, are we okay with that? Is that dystopian? Like, I think, I, I think it brings up a lot of these questions. What do you think about this, Shane? You and, I think you and I, one of the things we definitely agree on is looking at your society and try to, what's, how do you automate it? How do you automate some of the problems? Wait, how do you technologically eliminate this issue or that issue? Agreed. Why do we have speeding tickets if you can have cars that can basically understand what the speed limit is and not go beyond that point? Or why do you have um, intersections when you could put up a little metal barrier to prevent the car from moving and knocking somebody in the intersection? Let's say if they were blind, for example. We don't. We leave those things to people that just kind of work out. And we put tickets and, and, and all of these other penalties on it as opposed to technologically eliminating the problem in and of itself. What do you think about it? Do you, what do you think about the AI and the underclass thing? Or for that matter, the AI and the... I think oh. we talked about this before. Yeah. Like the Elon Musk idea of the world of things. Oh, sorry. And no, where no, that goes. I, I, yeah, or any of that. So, I mean, you can respond to any of that. Totally. No, yeah, thank you. There's a glitch on my head. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I've thought about this stuff a bunch. Uh, I don't know that how much I've talked about this on air, actually, either now or when I was a producer. But years ago, I was like uh, part of this organization that was doing research into existential risks. So doing research into uh, X risk is the short way of saying it, but basically... Again, these existential threats or global, global catastrophic threats. The, the classic example that a lot of people's minds go to is something like a meteor, you know, like a big meteor or asteroid or something coming to hit the Earth and destroying things, wreaking havoc. But, you know, you also have pandemics. You have the threat of AI. You have a lot of these, like, weird far future concerns that people bring up that would just paralyze or destroy, you know, categorically just destroy humanity as a whole. So anyway, we had this research outlet. We were looking into a lot of these things. With AI, and I, I kind of pushed away from this stuff. I push, pushed away from the standard way of looking at AI. AI. I developed my own kind of weird beliefs. Not sure they're right, but that's what I did. Um, with AI, a lot of what people are worried about is simply aligning them. So say you create something, and, and it's some people would say we're close. Some people would say it's impossible or we're still far away. Say you can align them. How can you align them safely? How can you do that in a way where they stay aligned, where they actually do what you want, where they do what's best for people? These are, these are abstract philosophical and ethical questions at a certain point, but there's also a practical way to look at this, which is simply how can you have an AI do what people actually want, not just misinterpret or do the genie inter you know, the genie thing where you, you use some of the formal structure of somebody's question, but you screw them over in the process. So there are these deep questions about how you align an AI, whether it's even possible. I don't know. I actually, this is what got me into a lot of this stuff about human nature and political philosophy and why I got back into politics, because I think fundamentally it is a political question. It's not just an ethical question. It's not just a philosophical one. AI is a political entity. You're creating, to the extent that you're creating a new consciousness, either a supplement to existing intelligence or it's going to be a new one, that is, it's a political question. It becomes a, a relation of power and inequalities. Um, those are fundamental to that. So there's so much there's so much to explore, but we've got callers and we're taking calls 202-521-1320. Let's go to Jim. We're going to come come to the other. We've got three others on the line. And again, 202-521-1320. You can join them. Jim is gone. Jim, and, Jim in Alexandria, you're uh, talking about Wisconsin. What's on your mind, Jim? Jim is gone. 
Oh, you John. Right, Let's you go to it. the next caller. Oh, Mike, Mike in Silver yeah. Spring. Thank, thanks for calling back. Mike in Silver Spring, you're calling back in. What's, what's going on? Yeah, regarding the AI, the question is, because I, I have done a lot of research into this, is, is can somebody go out into the woods and create a computer from scratch? And so my point is that it's, it, it's, it's magic. Computers are magic. Because how come I can't look at YouTube and see a DIY do-it-yourself tutorial on how to create computers from uh, uh, rock and let's wrap in thirty seconds. Maybe some steel because well, it's because it just it takes yeah. you need super, super com unless Why you're gonna as far as I can tell there are a few ways of doing it. You can either do it with Steam or something like that, which effectively nobody does. That's literally like they're technically if you're gonna go like the steampunk Victorian route, there are other ways to do it, but. Most computers require transistors, which just you, you require special, you know, scientific advances, but also special materials that you li literally can't harvest naturally in the woods and then use. It just takes tools, man. That's that's my understanding. But you can go and learn the basics. So you're talking about YouTube. You can go and educate yourself on the basics. We're going into a break. We're going to be back in a minute. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. Fault Lines. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for the latest news commentary and political analysis. What's really behind the political and social crisis gripping the United States and the world? If you're tired of a superficial and shallow reporting for the mainstream media, here's your alternative. Forget the spoon-fed sound bites from pundits who know so little about so much. We deal with real issues. War in the Middle East, the military-industrial complex, U.S.-Russian relations, the rise of China, austerity, mass migration, global warming, and social justice movements in the United States and around the world, and much more. We bring you independent experts, analysts, and activists. Learn what really makes the decision makers take from the boardroom of Wall Street to the West Wing of the White House. Here is where the people fighting for chance speak and are heard loud and clear. Five days a week on Radio Sputnik and SputnikNews.com. Fault Lines. And we're back. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We're taking calls 202-521-1320. For people who are completely bemused, completely left in the dark, he's talking about steam and computers. There's this great book, uh, The Diamond Age. Uh, Neil Stevenson involved in that. Interesting book. Yeah, just it covers some of that stuff too. I remember that. Um, anyway, we're going back into it. We're taking calls. We can go straight to them. On the line, I hear we have next Lou calling back in from Missouri. Lou, you're on the line again. What's going on? Uh, not much. It was uh, I was calling in response to Albert. I honestly, that was my first uh, exposure to Albert. Like I didn't know who they were, and it was pretty interesting to find out that that's someone who used to be in an elected office. That's what we said. Um, but uh, I just want to say that I, I have my question is why is it always that uh, that's a call for civility? It's always always at, from the state to the people. It's never. Right. When the acts of violence in the form of environmental uh, injustice and environmental racism and present-day redlining and state-sanctioned violence and uh, and poverty and housing insecurity, all of those things, those are all acts of violence. But the response to them is always supposed to be in a way that most Civility. of America finds to be palatable. Right, exactly. So I'm just I love that statement. Between those two. And that's, that's I not, love that I statement. It's always been that way, and no one ever gives me an answer to it. And I'll give you an answer to it. The state, the state was I'll give you an answer to it. I think the state was built to contain violence. Well, the state was built to contain order, not violence. The state has no issue with so dispensing how do you, how do you violence. How maintain order? <laughs> you mean they maintain order through violence? Well, how is it order if it's violence? Like, I guess because my point is, if a cop... Evolutionarily, like, belief, beneath all our civilizational constructs, I think fundamentally... The, the ultimate backstop is violence. The ultimate backstop is the use of the use of force. And the state is built to contain that, to restrain that. And therefore, everything that the state restrains, all of the structural iniquities, all of the structure of of society is sort of kept in its place by restraining violence, which would violently disrupt everything on that fundamental level. No, I disagree. I mean, I, I think people 
as right. the caller is making the point oh. that I think people underestimate or under um, don't realize how much violence it takes to keep the society the way it is. Like, as he said, if you are at home and you can't pay your rent next month, how do you feel? I mean, I understand nobody put their hands on you. I understand nobody punched you in the face. But I'm telling you, it eats away at you. It is painful if you are in a violent situation like oh. some of these neighborhoods. I mean, how many deaths took place in Chicago that, other, um, that time when we were talking about? It was like 12 deaths in 24 hours. That's people living yeah. in that. These are, these you are think people would live in that if they not, wanted to? Yeah, these are places where there is no effective state. These are places where the state does not executing its statehood or whatever. These are places they're in some Are you sense telling me the that the state doesn't exist in Chicago? Uh, effectively, no. Yeah, that's. I think that's where you see gangs rising. Why do gangs come into existence? Gangs come into existence when the state ceases to function. Literally, if you look at the Sicilian mafia, if you look at very various mafia organizations, they introduce their own rule of law. That's what they do. And then they capitalize on that. And that's why a lot of libertarians or different kinds of folks, anarchists included, will look at the state as a sort of organized criminal system, you know, as, as its own moth. And there are questions about that, but. No, no. I mean, yeah, I know libertarians think that, like taxes are violence and that type of stuff. But they're not entirely wrong. I mean, if look, if, if at the end of it all, meaning the tax man, the emails and everything else, there's a policeman that is willing to shoot you or put you in a cage, that's violence. I guess I'm making a point, Shane, that the caller is right. If you're talking about homelessness, help, I mean, punch me in the face. I don't want to be homeless. Like, if you're talking about oh, people not having... No, um, I think we agree ends. on that. I think he was still on the line. I think yeah, he yeah. was trying to actually come back with something. Oh, go um, for it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was just saying, I, I agree with the call, the premise of the call. So, but go ahead. If you're still here, um, please continue. Yeah, yeah I'm still here because, uh, I, I, you know, the, I, I, I lay the premise because, you know, things that go off and overlook, like, you know, Present day, uh, we hear people talk just now saying racism is a public health crisis uh, or pandemic. Well, the response to that assertion certainly hasn't been commensurate with what should happen for a pandemic. So even that, uh, or, or a public health crisis, even that I find to be a form of violence. If you're going to, as the CDC or... Are you still here? I think we might have lost him. Um, yeah. It, yeah, interesting, sure interesting you, conversation. We've, we've got other calls. It is a good conversation. I mean, point. Yeah, let's go to the other calls. But let me Maybe let me just make one response. Let's do it. Let's, do it. Let, let's let, yeah. um, 30 seconds. Um, the caller has a point. Um, we in this country, for the most part, allow we even um, we are clear with cops committing violence because in our head, that's the state, like you say, maintaining order um, in that sense. I think the caller's point, though, is valid that if I'm smoking plant or pot and I get put in a cage, is that, like, you know, are those things balanced out, especially if you end up with a racial skew and the number of people who ends up in those cages because of laws that are passed? I understand that the state is an institution to try to preserve order, but let's be very clear, the state is also an institution of violence. And all sorts of things go on in place that the state maintains, meaning pain, poverty, um, uh, uh, injustice. And the state doesn't care about those things. The state only cares about order. And I think the caller has a really good point of saying, why are we okay with one sort of violence, but the other sort of violence can get not just overlooked, but ignored. And I think part of that is you have a large section of your population that is okay. And the other section of population that is not okay, uh, when that population starts to get rowdy, this other population says, hey, we don't like that. In which case we need to put that down. Now, that can take the form of protests, that can take the form of riots, that can take the form of other extreme things. I guess the catch here is the balance is your society has to find a way to ameliorate the hard edges of that society so those extremes don't present themselves in the forms of explosions of human, let's say, emotion and, and, and destruction. I think that's the, that's the point, right? Like, even though it's maintaining balance, there's a balance that's going underneath all of that. And that stuff explodes from time to time. And people hate it but they don't want to deal with the reasons that those things erupt. And it's like, uh, you know, wag the finger at the eruption of it, but not wag the finger at the precursors of it that is um, propagating your system. That's all. I, I guess that's, that's where I think we the call is coming from. It's like, no, we've got, you went, you said 30 seconds, but it's like 100 seconds or something like that. We've got, that's now, true. I, my, my sense of timing is screwed up, so that's fair. But let's go to the next one. Uh, Brave and ATL. Yeah. Brave in Great Atlanta. Job. What's going on? Hey, how's it going, guys? I was actually calling in to, uh, to respond to, uh, I guess his name was Elbert. Uh, Elbert, yeah. I, I, 
fascinating. Yeah, I find it very fascinating that. Um, so, so I thought I could have sworn heard him say that he was a civil a civil rights activist uh, back in the day at some point, or a civil rights attorney, or something like that. Yeah. It seems he that how, it, yeah, it seems that our leaders, uh, speaking specifically about our black leaders, um, they seem to get uh, I don't know assimilated <laughs> at some point, and then they they turn against the very movement that they were a part of and spearheaded in the beginning as they find themselves uh, becoming comfortable or acquiring some some sort of power, right? Um, he, 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 I did agree with him on some of his political views uh, concerning like the, the Democrats and Republicans and how the race is being ran. But um, I, I just thought that was really strange for him to say that we should that that um, the people that should be protected by the public official, uh, the public servant, should take more responsibility than the public servant who's been hired to do the job. Why? I don't understand why. No, I understand why. The people are expected to be rational and behave themselves. And, you know, say and, and not and not conduct themselves in a violent manner in the face of violence, in the face of oppression. Meanwhile, those who are paid to do a job to protect, to be rational, are given the leeway of, of oh, they have fear of wanting to get back home to their families, as if the the citizen doesn't have those same fears and desires. And I think that right. the people that make excuses for those public servants, for those um, political officials who aren't doing their job for the state oppressing certain people. I think those people have um, some sense of vulnerability to the loss of order and the structure of things, just as, as just as not in a smaller way, but just in the same way that our uh, public officials and our ruling class do. I think that the true violence is, or the, the, the true joke of the matter, is that um, we're asked to not be violent. We're put, we put down violence, oh, don't be violent, even though everything that's come, up, that's come about in this nation has come from violence. So what one could argue that the uh, state is doing its job. It's not failing. It's doing its job. It's making sure that you do not act, that you do not overthrow, that you do not take power so that they maintain their power. Great. Thank Thanks for the call. Great. We've got a lot of calls. Um, yeah. should, so let's go to Kevin in Detroit. Detroit. We'll probably have him on again soon. What's yeah. up? Elbert was good. We, I loved Elbert. I thought that was a great conversation. So, But let's go to Kevin in Detroit. We have another response to Elbert. Hey, Kevin? Uh, this is Zach Stedman in Detroit. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, well, I kind of wanted to piggyback off of the previous caller, uh, also comment on Albert. So, I mean, I had really the same thing to say about how it's interesting that, uh, you know, we're expected to hold the average citizen to a higher standard than the police who are supposedly trained to do this job. But the other point of that is, you know, as far as riots, we can all say that we would like the riots to be a different way or that we would like them to just be peaceful protests. But we're still not getting to the bottom of it all, which is why do people feel like a riot is their only cor uh, 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 course of action that they can take to get any type of results that they're looking for? You know, uh, like Martin Luther King said, a riot is the, what is it, the, the cry of the unheard. And so yeah. when we understand that a riot is really a last resort. Uh, we have I don't to think any of those people want to be out there, Stepman. No, like, I, I only guarantee you, no one wants to be out there in that riot. I mean, no one does. I mean, if they're out there, something pushes them to do it. And let's be, you know, honest about it. That, I, look, like I said, I don't think anyone got up that day and said, I want to go out there and burn stuff down. Nobody. I think all of them had better things to do. And so, go ahead, Seven. I'm sorry. Please finish. Yeah, and so I, I think, you know, if the, if the if one thing that Albert said that did make sense, if the people in, in the political power were doing their jobs, from top to bottom, officers would be held accountable. And so the citizens wouldn't feel like they had to take matters into their own hands where you get in a situation where emotions are running high and people do things, you know, in the heat of the moment without thinking about the, the, the consequences or, you know, the uh, subsequent actions that are going to happen. You know, we don't have anybody from, from the police to the president to the Congress to the mayor to the governor who's being held accountable. You want to put all the blame on the citizen. We've just got to stay in line. And so I think even with what the previous caller was saying, too, I mean, America was founded on violence. It is sustained through violence. And it is through violence that they hope to squash this uprising that's coming forward. And so, I mean, I agree. Only, so, I mean wait, we've got to go to other calls. Thank you for the call. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the call. Kevin. Thank uh, you for the call, Kevin. Yeah. I mean, real quick, my, my five-second comment there is that every state, as far as I can tell, is built on violence. You can criticize the American state, and I think the American state does deserve some unique criticism, but it's, it's not literally, it's not just us. I'm not trying to excuse anything, but I'm just saying literally, that is, as far as I can tell, formally how states work. 
Um, but again, yeah, you can look at America on its own too. Uh, I think we've got Joe calling on. Joe calling in next. Those 25 Joe, seconds, Shane. Calling in from Pennsylvania. <laughs> You're on the line. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, it was the same. I was. I wanted to make a comment on that same uh, comment about the uh, responsibility that people have when they're receive an order from the police. So, so what I've noticed in my experience, like I had to do shore patrol in the Navy. When somebody's intoxicated, they're not going to respond to orders. So it just seems like there, there has to be like a, maybe a different training or something when they suspect. I'm not saying that's in all cases, but I remember there's a, there's a video from Pennsylvania. We've got to take a break soon. Area, a police woman, she, it was the dash cam that captured it all. That's before body cams. And She's trying to restrain some guy that's clearly intoxicated, and she can't physically control him. So she just pulls out the 9 millimeter and pops him in the back twice and then cuffs him. And she was found not guilty because, they, you know, she said she feared for her life. It was clear the guy was just intoxicated and didn't want to comply with her. That's all. Thank you for all the right. call, man. We're going to take the break. The yeah. We've got like two more callers. Two more callers we've got to get to on the other side of this break. Thank you for the call, though, Joe in Pennsylvania. We're going to be back in a second. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. Back in a minute. Fault Lines. Catch all the breaking global political and economic news as it happens. Sputnik brings an all-star lineup with expert opinion from some of the biggest names in the news today. Noam Chomsky. Turkey, U.S. ally. Now, their main goal is to attack the Kurds, now, the one ground force opposing ISIS. And there have been a kind of a funnel for support of ISIS, not officially, but in practice. Peter Sunday, co-founder of the Pirate Bay. We don't have any sort of democratic control over the internet. And I think that we're very naive when we think that the internet itself is intrinsically good. It's not. It's just a very neutral technology that is being used for good things, but more and more being used for evil things. Icelandic Foreign Minister Gunnar Bragi Svensson. We increase activities in the Kepler Air Base, and that has to do with more um, activities from the Russian Northern Fleet in the ocean around Iceland, and also, of course, these usual flights of the bombers. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We're the ones that destroy the government of Libya. We're the ones that are putting in a pipeline to scare that. Hi, is this Ben? The government Hello, is this Ben? Hey, Ben, just stay on hold there. Uh, we're in break right now. You would actually want to see the technology because there's always a danger of blundering. Sputnik talks to the brightest minds in politics and current affairs to find out what's really happening. Tune in. Yo! So, Sean, what do you want to talk about today? Well, Bob, that's easy. I want to talk about the need to stop the development of self-driving cars. Again, Sean, you're driving me nuts. I think the self-driving car thing's already out of the gate. No, 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 it's never too late. See, now the leading experts in the field, I mean, just pick one, whichever one, leading experts have repeatedly warned us about the dangers of artificial intelligence. Look, I'm telling you, man, we have to stop the robots by any means necessary. Uh, I see what you did there. Yep. Tune into our show by any means necessary daily from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Radio Sputnik. And don't forget to call in at 3.20 p.m. to our studio number 202-521-1320. And if you miss us live, check us out on SputnikNews.com, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on the latest political, social, and economic news movements shaping the world around us. Fault Lines. And we're back. Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. We're joined by Ben Swan for this segment. But first, before we intro him, before we go to Ben, we've got a few callers hanging on from the last segment. An inordinately packed segment uh, in terms of the calls. We've got Joshua calling in. Joshua, you're on the line. What's going on? Hey, uh, so just like Real quick, uh, the fires and a lot of the vandalism being caused uh, is largely attributed to false flags as well. Anyone mentioned that, you know, right-wing militias working police, just like in Wisconsin, they killed a few people last night. And uh, it's also on the back of Obama saying that no citizen is above the law. And at the same time, someone gets water bottles and pats on the back of it, killing someone. 
anyway, my point of the AI was, I was wondering, just out of curiosity. Wait, 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 my, real, real quick, real quick. I think he got the water bottle before he killed the person. Oh, really? If I'm not mistaken, the cop gave him the water bottle before he killed him. But I know what you're talking about. I could be wrong, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. The right-wing militia yeah. basically was working with yeah. the cops. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's just crazy that Obama was just saying that, you know, no man, no one's above the law. You know, there's so many ironies with that, but it's obviously, like, in your face, not true, like, on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, but with the AI thing, I just had a question, Jamal, uh, Jamal which is um, with, like, if – AI becomes good enough that we don't have to work manual, manual jobs and, you know, maybe get like a substantial UBI. Wouldn't that give us like more freedom to actually resist properly, like create art that would maybe help us, things like that on that nature? Yep. Like we wouldn't be 20 seconds. So broken down, yes, as long as it's not entirely controlled by 1%. I mean, if 1% of the people <laughs> yeah, control that's, all that's of the like, AI, then quick. yeah. Yeah, Jamal. Okay. No, I'm just yeah, pitching in on that exactly. That's the thing is if you start yes, if you start giving out a dole, then you have to wonder like what's on the other side of that, and if the people who are giving out that dole are secretly trying to influence behaviors or explicitly trying to influence behaviors. Um, yeah, great question. But we've got another caller calling. Yeah, in. we have another call. Should... Thank you for the call, Joshua in Pennsylvania. We've got Tammy in D.C. Tammy, you're on the line. What's going on? Okay, you talk. Um, some I don't know who said it, but. Um... You talk about when you don't have no money to pay your rent. How how about you had money, you paid your rent, and you got evicted, and you went through all avenues, and the the court shut me down. Well, no, they told me everything went into the escrow account. It was my rent was sitting in the escrow account in the court because things need to be paid, need to be done in the apartment. And they evicted me anyway and went back to the courts. And the court said, well, we saw there's nothing else to do. They got on the landlord, but guess what? They never told them to re refund me back my money with three small kids. I'm so sorry. That's not good. You are not yeah. alone. Like, you are, unfortunately, yeah. this is, that's, that's the evictions have been taking place. Yeah. And they're talking about, like, tens of millions of people being evicted. I'm so of, sorry. Within our network, at Sputnik, I mean, I know that like Bob over at Political Misfits, I know that there are a couple of people who are active in, in the D.C. activist community. Um, are you aware of any? I'm not in D.C. Any, anymore, so I haven't been paying attention to this stuff. Are you aware of any like programs, legal assistance programs, those kinds of programs that we might be able to refer Tammy to that are going on? I'm not. I mean, like my mom used to work for social service or social um, services in Richmond. And so she would be able to help, you know, like point people in directions. But I know of nothing in D.C. I mean, we just literally moved up here. Um, Tammy, if you if you there's a chance that if you call into political misfits uh, later mm -hmm. today, they might be able to give you give, give you some advice. I'm sorry. I can't. And we've got to get to Ben Swan. That sounds like a really no, rough situation. But... All right. Thank you. Uh huh. Bye bye. Thank you I'm for sorry, the call, Tammy. Tammy. Yeah, that, that sounds rough. That's not, that's not the kind of thing that should happen. Thank you for the call. And thank you for telling us about that. And please, good luck. But I think that's kind of for, that's yeah, kind of the other caller's call point. Call. The people have to endure this. And you have some people who endure it internally, and you have some who express that outside um, and into your society deals with it. It's, you know, it's like that's something that we can that we can do with policy. We just don't. But let's, but you're right. Let's go to Ben Swan. Yeah. Uh, but we, we have Ben right. Swan yeah. here. Ben Swan, ben Swan is award-winning television news anchor, investigative journalist, and host on the program Boom Bust airing weekdays on RT America. Um, ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. Um, so we've been following, well, at this point, we're perched at the edge of the world. We follow pretty much everything. But we've been following the protests that were been taking place in Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. Um, no body cams. Now, the footage that was released, if I'm not mistaken, they released footage. I could be wrong, but they released footage showing that there was apparently a fight just before the shooting. Have you been able to get any more information um on what took place prior. Because as one of the callers said, we only saw part of it, and it seems that part of it is missing. Um, can you give us an update on what is taking place in Kenosha, Wisconsin right now from the standpoint of the legal thing with the cop itself, or for that matter, even additional information on what we know right now? Yeah, right now it seems like, and I apologize because I have not gotten up to date this morning uh, specifically on this, uh, but essentially, uh, from what I can tell, you know, the body cam issue seems to be a big one. 
uh, of what's taking place in Wisconsin. Uh, we talked about this um, quite a bit actually in depth yesterday. The fact that uh, really in Kenosha itself was supposed to have instituted body cams for their 200 member police force uh, for several years now. Uh, this was actually voted on back in 2017. Um, and yet it has not been followed through. In fact, um, it was not supposed to be instituted, we're told, by the mayor until the year 2022. So the, the fact that that is uh, even a possibility seems absolutely insane right now. No, but I apologize. In terms of uh, the very latest of what's well, happening in, uh, in Kenosha, I do not have that for you. Just to interrupt real quick. So 13 minutes ago, this was released. Uh, despite years of plans to implement police-worn body cameras in Kenosha, city officials have not yet purchased or deployed the devices, citing video storage and budget concerns. Now, because of Jacob Blake's shooting, right. Kenosha wasn't captured on police video. The only publicly available images of the incident are from a distant videos taken by onlookers instead, or from officers who shot him on the scene. So yeah, basically the whole um, okay. body cam footage cool. thing. Yeah because it goes along with what we were still reporting yesterday, which is that, yes, in fact, um, okay, so Kenosha did prove, as I mentioned, the, the use of body cams by officers as of 2017, but then the mayor has said that they were going to institute it in their budget in the year 2022. So think about that, guys. You're talking about essentially saying five years from now, we'll start using body cams. Five years after city council says we have to start using them. And I think this is an important point in terms of, of police uh, reform. You know, there's all these calls right now to defund police. And I think the problem isn't defunding them, that they, that they get too much money. It's that there's no accountability for how funding is spent in the first place, including the fact that the mayor says, well, we don't have the budget for body cams. Well, then that's where the funding needs to go. That's where the shift needs to be is for greater accountability. And we're not seeing accountability. And when you don't have accountability, then there's no trust in the system. That's very fair. Yeah, that's very fair. I agree with that. I mean, I thought the defunded police thing was slight askew. Um, anyway, I, I thought it was too diminutive, believe it or not, um, for all of the energy and everything else that was being put into this. The riots or the protests, however you want to call it, in Wisconsin, how do you frame it? I mean, you've been a reporter for a very long time. You've watched, you know, um, you know, events take place over the course of X number of years in the United States. When you're looking at either the protests, either shooting, either for that matter, what is taking place across America? If you had to frame 2020, how would you do it? Well, I would say that there is an increased level of frustration, um, but I also see an organized effort. So, you know, when you see in Portland, uh, the destruction that's taking place there in Chicago, in Kenosha, even right now, you have a lot of small businesses that are being destroyed, that are being burned. This is not moving forward um, actual reform. And this is what frustrates me because I've been covering this now since 2014. I, I was in Ferguson, Missouri. I was in Baltimore after Freddie Gray's death. I went to New York after the death of Eric Gardner. So I have seen all of these situations firsthand and covered them firsthand. And I've also seen activists who are truly working on how do you fix a broken system? Well, now what we see is a lot of these protesters some of them are sincere, but some are not. And, and what they're not looking for is reform. They're not looking for ways to fix a broken system. They're looking for ways to utterly upend the system. And that won't serve poor communities. And that won't serve uh, people who are underserved right now. But we, we don't need to uh, you know, abolish police departments. But what we do need to say is stop profiting through police departments. Stop using police departments as a form of taxation on the public because all these mayors who go out. Oh, wait, you need to explain that. Wait, 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 Ben, refusing. you need to explain that. They're not not yeah. everybody's going to understand that. Explain that. Well, explain I was going to say, you have all these mayors like who the... go out and they stand with, right, well, this is what I'm going to say. So you have all these mayors who go out there and stand there. But what they're not admitting to is that in every city in the United States, whether it's a small town or a large city, the majority of the city's revenue is being derived either through property taxes or through the police departments. And in many cases, it is the police department that is responsible for some of the largest line item budgets in the entire city in terms of revenue, not in terms of expenses, in terms of revenue. So when we ask the question about defunding the police and the question is asked, 
where people say, well, how is it that we have police departments that get so much money? Well, the reason they get so much money is because they derive, in the, according to the terminology, revenue for cities through fines and fees. And so remember just a couple of years ago, there was a, a group of police officers in New York who were angry at Bill de Blasio, who was the mayor. They were angry at him. And so the police union said, we're only going to respond to actual crimes. And they stopped writing traffic tickets and they stopped handing out fines to people. And when the police department did that over two weeks, they cost the city millions of dollars in revenue for just two weeks of, of halting. Well, that is revenue that's being derived and taken from the poorest communities in most cases. And by the way, I'd remind your listeners, that was the primary problem that came out of the Justice Department's investigation into Ferguson. It was not that there was an inordinate number of black men being killed by police. The number one finding was the entire community is being wrecked by a police department that is deriving massive amounts of revenue in fines and fees from a poor community. And so there's there are other ways that you are Ben, we'll be right back. Let's community. Hold and, on, Ben. We'll be right back. You guys are listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan with, with Ben Swan, award-winning television news anchor. We'll be back in a moment. Fault Lines. The tough questions are the most powerful weapon we have. As long as you have questions, we'll keep asking. Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Feeling kind of blue, but maybe also kind of red. And kind of purple, and kind of alone. You've got a friend on Radio Sputnik. Tune into Political Misfits from 12 to 2 Eastern Time, Monday through Friday, for news, politics, and culture without the two party bias. Catch us daily on 105.5 in Washington, D.C., or 102.9 or 104.7 in Kansas City. Or find us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your news. Fault Lines. And we're back. back. You're listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. And Swan. Yeah, Thomas and Stranahan and Swan. Uh, We're joined by Ben Swan for this segment, continuing our conversation. And last, we were talking about Kenosha, Wisconsin. And at the end there, about the uh, role of police in some cities as like this extractive force, extracting wealth, making money for local governments. A lot of people don't know about that stuff. Something we should talk about more on the air. But we actually brought Ben Swan originally on talk about hydroxychloroquine he has a report now that was newer it was a, it was a couple weeks old at this point when we brought you on last time we wanted to get into it but we got swamped talking about sweden we only got a minute at the end um where we were talking about hydroxychloroquine what's what's your take obviously hydroxychloroquine uh, anti-malarial drug it's been incredibly politicized uh, the medical establishment consensus right now seems to be that it's ineffective uh although there's a, sub- a substantial minority i'll put it that way at least in the public but also apparently in the medical establishment that thinks that the, a case can be made, that it can be used. It seems, uh, just briefly, I'm going to pass it over to you, Ben, to make your report. My, my understanding of hydroxychloroquine is that it's useful in the first part where you have the viral replication. Once you get to the inflammatory phase, it becomes less useful. And that's, that's just makes, that makes sense as an anti-malarial. It's used to fight off infections. That's, that's my understanding. And it seems like a lot of early uh, scholarly mistakes led to later misunderstandings, and then it got politicized and uh, the, mod- the, the waters were forever muddy. But Ben, you've done more research. What's your take on this? What, what should we know about hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, I, li- I like the terminology you used. The, the water has been certainly muddied around this. And I think what's very interesting about hydroxychloroquine is there was, a, uh, first of all, a study that was done a few years ago that took a look at hydroxychloroquine uh, and its effects on fighting uh, different viruses and possibly even the SARS coronavirus. Remember the original coronavirus back in 2002, 2003, um, there was a study done to see whether or not hydroxychloroquine would have an effect on SARS. It it did in the study that was done. Of course, SARS is not COVID, but as recently as July of this year, a separate group known as the Henry Ford Health Center in Michigan conducted a controlled study, the first real controlled study of hydroxychloroquine on actual patients with coronavirus. And what they found, which is fairly interesting, is that um, hydroxychloroquine actually cut the death rate in half 
for people who were already on a respirator who needed um, uh, some kind of additional treatment. And so they did find that it was successful in that. But I think the bigger issue surrounding this is not a, it, it, this is not meant to necessarily be uh, ad, an advocacy pitch for hydroxychloroquine and to say how great it is. It's to say, why aren't we taking more steps to get better information and better studies about cheap alternatives? Remember, hydroxychloroquine costs about 30 cents a pill. There's no patent on it. And so why isn't more studying being done? Again, the CDC can be running this. The NIH can be running this instead of just immediately saying we have no interest in it. And instead, we want to focus only on untested vaccines that, by the way, will not be cheap and will make big pharmaceutical companies billions of dollars. Then why do you think we're not pursuing that? Then? Do you think it's just a politicization? Or do you think it's, it's like you're saying it right at the end there? There's this substantial economic interest at play uh, and, and politically that's not just motivated, but it's being enforced. What's your take on why actually, why actually, assuming for a second no. that hydroxychloroquine is effective and information about it is being suppressed, we can get back into that. But just to make that case, why do you think that's being done? Well, I think it really does come down to money. I think as a journalist, you know, you always have to follow the money and, and who's profiting and who is not. And, and the reality is, is that if you can find very inexpensive ways to treat any virus, um, you're going to essentially cut out these groups that are literally spending and making billions of dollars uh, to create these drugs. And so, when, listen, I'm not saying that hydroxychloroquine, again, will work in every case or in mo even in most cases, but I'm saying the unwillingness to even consider it by those who are in, in authority in these health agencies uh, seems very strange to me. Then meanwhile, as I said, you have individual doctors and health groups that are saying, well, we'll run our own tests on this because we are seeing success with it. Listen, if you can save one person's life, uh, by using a 30 cent pill that is worth pursuing and looking at as opposed to just outright dismissing it and and let's let's not be coy about this the the influence of pharmaceutical companies and the influence that these groups have on Washington and on health policy is undue influence and it's it happens at an absolutely staggering level we all know that so let's not pretend that that uh, pharmaceutical companies just want the best outcome. They want the most profitable outcome. That's what they're in business for. Thousand percent agree with health and companies wanting the most profitable outcome. No, no concern. I mean, every incentive in the world is for them to do that. So that part I agree with. Um, I remember the study that I think you alluded to about the SARS part. That was chloroquine. That wasn't necessarily hydrochloroquine, unless there was another study dealing with the hydrochloroquine that I'm not necessarily aware of. But chloroquine is not entirely the same drug as hydrochloroquine, nor is SARS the same disease as um, COVID-19, even though they may sell, share similar properties. Also, the Henry Ford study um, that is mentioned, the study that sparked the latest controversy was anything but randomized, and then it only was a study not randomized, outside experts noted, but patients who received hydrochloroquine were also more likely to get steroids, which appeared to help sick patients with COVID-19, meaning even though Henry Ford plays made that study, that study was not necessarily the greatest of studies in order to give some kind of declare, declarative statement of, of, of effectiveness of hydrochloroquine, especially when it was used in combination with something that might have made the patients better in and of themselves. Is that a fair point to make about hydrochloroquine? Look, I have no feelings about hydrochloroquine. I have, I, I, I'm not, if, right. if they came out tomorrow and said, all of these other studies were wrong, hydrochloroquine worked, I would come on the show and say, great, hydrochloroquine worked. If they get it tomorrow and said it doesn't, then I would feel the same. To me, this is a scientific question, a yay or nay. Um, but it does seem like the Ford study is dodgy at best. I agree with you that it, you know, people go out and they make their own studies, but hydrochloroquine has been studied. Like this, the, the reason that many of these places proclaim that it didn't work is because study after study after study start coming out showing that it is not effective against COVID. Do you accept that as being fair? I mean, I'm not taking this from a political standpoint. I'm purely taking this from the standpoint of, I just want to know what works and what doesn't. And it seems like there's a preponderance of evidence that says it does not. And um, even the study that kind of said does has problems with it. And since science typically deals with multiple studies, multiple things going into it and ensuring that the studies were accurate and that there were no faults in the study, this raises questions again about the effectiveness of hydrochloroquine. Am I wrong? Or am I, so, did I say so, something that so you think you, is wrong? You're making, 
No, you, you're making some good points. There's there's one thing I would push back on. So you, number one, yes, you are correct that uh, one of the questions about the Henry Ford Health study was that uh, they used, yes, steroids in some cases. And so there are questions about which was having the effect. But again, that's why I'm saying, well, continue to study it, right? Don't just dismiss it outright. Let's take a look at it. And if it is a combination of things, a steroid, which by the way, is cheap, and hydroxychloroquine, which is cheap, and those two things together are the answer to some of these issues, then great. But I want to also Agreed. push back. You did say there were a couple of different studies that had, w did look at hydroxychloroquine, and those studies um, essentially showed that it didn't work. And one of those was published in The Lancet, which is a, obviously a very influential medical journal. The other one in the New England Journal of Medicine. Those are kind of the two main studies of hydroxychloroquine that outright dismissed it. But what media has ignored is that both of those studies, as we covered in our report, both of those studies were retracted after both the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine asked the, the, uh, the groups that had studied hydroxychloroquine to present their data, and the groups refused to provide data to them. And so, so both the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine retracted those articles, saying that we find that these articles cannot, or these uh, papers, these published papers, cannot be trusted because they refuse to submit their data to a third party to analyze whether or not they were accurate. So that's also important to consider that some of the most influential uh, studies that have set into place the process of saying hydroxychloroquine cannot be trusted are no longer even published. They've been retracted. So all I'm saying yes, is you got to take a look at these, yes, these issues and whether or not, you know, that's happened is a huge issue. No, that's Other fair. side of this, okay, totally so fair. it seems like you guys actually agree. I think we all agree this is something that should be studied more. I think part of this, I'm going to go back actually to Robert Redfield and Anthony Fauci and the World Health Organization, various leading public officials who recommended at one point that people not wear masks, that, that discouraged people from wearing masks. And they had a sort of white lie that they were uh, telling there in order to try to reserve masks for medical professionals. But regardless, this is a, I would, I'm going to yes. use that as a case where the, the, the medical waters were muddy. That complicated things, and that made it very difficult to speak about these issues. And then I'm going to go back. So ha with that as a frame, I'm going to go back a couple of months ago with chloroquine, where if you may remember early on, a couple or a man, it was a couple that was did this stuff. A man died. A wife was hospitalized. Inge ingested fish tank cleaner that had chloroquine phosphate in it. And this right. was this was again months ago. This is back in March. Um, but it seems like from an early date, there was a lot of back and forth where, where studies were gotten wrong. There was a sort of, again, a politicization of it where the media was talking about it. Is this another, Ben, do you think this is another case where maybe there's a business interest at play, like you're saying, but maybe this is also another case where medical officials are not wanting to inspire false confidence in hydroxychloroquine, and they're, they're interested in pursuing it. Maybe research is getting suppressed specifically because they're trying to sort of swing the pendulum back in that other direction by you know, not pursuing it as a, as a surefire remedy. Do you think that's also at play or do you just see this primarily as a business interest thing too? What's your take, Ben? You know, I, I got to say, I, I go back to the business interest. And, and the reason for that is, a, is twofold. Number one, um, consider the fact that if you were not interested in the business side of it, let's say that, that all these medicines were going to be free. Congress said you can't charge for anything related to COVID. Well, number one, most pharmaceutical companies would stop pursuing any kind of uh, solution whatsoever. Uh, number two, if that were the case, uh, we might be able to have some honest discussions about what is the fastest way to get to a remedy. Remember, we are pushing right now a vaccine, the concept of a vaccine that would be the fastest any vaccine has ever been created in human history. Uh, and there's a lot of warnings about what that would look like because it's not being properly vetted. But I also think you have to look at uh, there is a complex that is built around the medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry, and that includes uh, groups of quasi-journalists who don't actually report accurately on these issues and instead are creating uh, publications and articles on behalf of pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies, we did a report on this a few years ago, completely unrelated to COVID, um, have entire branches that do nothing but write press releases and news articles that they get then pay to have published in certain newspapers and to get those reports into onto television news sites. And yeah. You have to recognize there is a massive complex at play here, and you you can't just trust and take them at their word that they're trying to do the right thing. There has to be accountability. I think you're absolutely right, and this this is yeah. we're out of time, but this comes at, a, at you know as a part of a wider crisis. But it's also a crisis, I think, of 
medical authority, of institutional authority yes. uh, on a very deep level. Because like you're saying, on the back end, through public relations, through lobbying, through you know regulatory capture, different mechanisms, a lot of the a lot of the institutions that we should trust have been co-opted. But again, we've got to leave it there. Great conversation. That was Ben Swan. Ben Swan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Ben Swan, award-winning television news anchor, investigative journalist, and a host on the program Boom Bus that airs weekdays on RT America. You can follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Swan with an underscore. So I'll do this Ben Swan, that's Swan with two N's at the end, and then an underscore, the character underscore, Ben Swan underscore on Twitter. You can also check out his website, truthinmedia.com. And again, catch him on Boom Bus that airs weekdays on RT America. We're ending the show today. We will be back tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Engineer Andre and our producers. You've been listening to Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. Guys, I want to thank you all for joining us again. Fault Lines with Thomas and Stranahan. Another really good show. Um, I Look, at this point, you guys know me. I love to argue. And in my head, when somebody says something that I disagree with, it's like, it's like, wait, I think that guy just said something to disagree with. And then, you know, just kind of working your way through there. Um, I am not, um, I'm not an idol in the sense of um, looking at the world and trying to force it to be my point of view. I think if anybody's watching my channel, you know me well enough to know that I would say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong on that. Or stick to what I think is necessarily right if I think the other person is wrong. But not in the sense of doing it just for political ends or just to do, to do it. So I like having um, those conversations. And sometimes, you know, it's like, I, <laughs> we had a really good conversation with Elbert today. And I know Elbert set a lot of people off, but he's calm. He tries to explain his point. Um, I think when he's looking at Democrats, I think he was right. When he's looking at Republicans, I think he's giving a too gentle of a view. Um, by the same token, I do think it was a good conversation, especially on the issue of police shootings. And it was a conversation that I do think also was, you know, didn't devolve sometimes into entirely emotional ways of talking about it as opposed to trying to um, talk about it honestly and that type of thing. So I thought it was a good show today, man. Um, Joshua Zapta. Not sure if I remember... Not sure if I remember our convo, but you were right. Elon Musk is a huge douche. <laughs> Have you spoken of Wisconsin militia and the police? I'm a right. Yeah, we hit that today. We were talking about the um, the people who were shot and the militias. Basically, you had people coming in pickup trucks and shooting protesters. Now, if there's a question that, you know, if a guy was about to set a car on fire, is it fair game to murder him, to stop him from doing that? I don't think so. So, you know, the notion that these guys went out there, they had guns, the protesters didn't. They had weapons, the protesters didn't. Meaning the only um, chance of violence here is at the very least them being provocative in regards to those guns, but on top of them being provocative with those guns, using those guns. Now the catch becomes, are they gonna be prosecuted for basically shooting people, whether they were protesters or rioters? And you can make a case as a fair game to murder rioters. Uh, but I would say, no, I don't think it is. You had a bunch of right-wingers that decided to descend on the area with weapons. Look, I agree with you. I don't particularly like riots either. But I damn sure I don't think the solution for it is having vigilantes basically go out to go after other people who consider themselves probably vigilantes or pushing back against oppression. This is a recipe for disaster. And look, whatever you want to think, whether you want to blame the rioters, whether you want to blame the protesters, whether you want to blame the cop that shot the guy, whether you want to blame the guy that got shot. However you want to pursue this, ultimately what you have is that the end point of the decision space is narrow. You may start off here with all sorts of uh, um, things that you can do, all sorts of ideas, kind of like a chessboard, that when you start off, you have all sorts of potential. The potential is limited, yes, but you have all sorts of potential. The further on you get into that, the less your potential is, especially if you've made bad choices. Now, the catch is, when you're talking about society, a bad choice, what does it mean for a bad choice? Is it a bad choice in a political sense where you are not paying attention to human development, human health, human happiness, human life? But they don't consider that a bad choice. They consider that a normal way of acting in the political space. I consider it a bad choice because I think it breeds those outcomes. And they look at that outcome 
and they consider that outcome completely and utterly detached from the policies that these guys were putting in effect, the things that they were allowing to take place. And yeah, not holding cops accountable. You can defund the police all you want. If you still have cops and those cops are unaccountable, defunding them is not necessarily going to get to the root of the matter, which is why I kept saying it's too diminutive at that phrasing. And it's politically unfortunate. The issue is poverty. Deal with poverty. The issue is unaccountability. Deal with unaccountability. That gets to a political thing. That gets to a policy argument. And those are things that those cops are explicitly there to avoid. Pay poor people to police other poor people. And people are shocked to shit when those cops, with all sorts of authority, no accountability, easily, seemingly anyway, brandish their weapons. What happens if those cops didn't have guns and they had billy clubs? Everybody walks out alive. Some people may be bruised, meaning the person who's they're beating the shit out of. But at the very least, he is not paralyzed. He walks out. We need to change our society. And the, I think the thing that grates me the most is that you have a segment of your society that would say, if they do anything, if they talk back to the officer at all, clean shoot, maximum justice. That's obscene. The notion that you give car blanche and authority to cops to behave in almost pretty much any sort of way and then let them walk is obscene. And you're shocked that that level of no accountability breeds a society that fights and pushes back. Don't be. The extremes that you allow are the extremes that you create. It's very simple. You have an equation, you have to balance that, right? And if you have one side of that equation that is, is people living in horrible situations, caustic situations, the woman that called in, Tammy, that is violence. That's a person without a home. That's a person who's sitting there not knowing how they're going to make ends meet, how they're going to get rent, how they're going to get food, how they're going to get, you know, live off. That's violence. And then you have, add to that, cops killing people, murdering people, and walk. And it seems to be a certain segment of the population that it is that much more likely for those cops to walk or those cops to commit that crime. Yeah, you have people who are all sorts and out of shape, and that gets expressed on the streets. I don't necessarily like it. I would wager to you that they don't like it either. And all things being equal, they don't necessarily want to be out there. And yet, there they are. It's, you know, you can deal with those things, but those things are dealt with through policy that take place before it gets to the point of people being shot or people, for that matter, protesting. Wesley Walker Jr., I don't see a Maximum Justice t-shirt in the store yet. I'm going to get one. I'm going to get one. My, my wife, um, as a gift, gave me one, but that one needs to be altered a little bit. That one needs a little bit more umph to it um, to give the whole maximum justice the punch it deserves. I'm going to end this here, guys. You will be seeing me later today. I have a doctor's appointment, unfortunately. Um, actually, believe it or not, i got to get a COVID test. So I have a surgery coming up on Monday, another one, in order to fix the previous one. In order to get any procedures, doesn't matter what it is, got to get a COVID test. And so the last procedure, the COVID test was fine, clear. And it's like, can I use the last one? Nope, nope, nope. You got to get a completely different one for the procedure. So that's what I will be later today. Um, like, share, and of course, subscribe.